I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Folks are going to be trickling in over the course of the day. And we've got folks online already as well. So thank you so much to everybody who's here to join us for our conference or our workshop on imagining environmental governance um, in the Anthropocene. So I'll say a little bit more about why this topic um, and the sort of genesis of how we came up with it. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to, to say a couple of thanks and then introduce um, Laura Lawson. But this is a workshop that is funded by Rutgers Global. Oh, sorry, I'm Pam McAwee. I'm at the Department of Human Ecology. Um, and we are one of the co-sponsors of the event, along with the Institute for Earth, Atmospheric, and Ocean Sciences, and the Rutgers Climate Institute. And the funding is from the Rutgers Global Grants that were made in 2020 on environmental change. And it's unfortunately taken us this long to get back in person. Um, but I'll say a little bit more about why this topic. But for now, I want to introduce um, Executive Dean Laura Lawson of the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences to welcome us to, for me, it's the first in-person event in two years. So thank you. Yay. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming. I'm Laura Lawson. I'm the Executive Dean for the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences and Executive Director for the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, and it's a delight to be here. It's a delight that you guys are starting this semester on such a high note. I think that this is, this is excellent. And when I first saw that this conference was happening this week, I'm like, really? And then I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's great because it's really gonna kind of set kind of a, a, a level of our discourse higher as a result of this conversation and all of us being together. So, so thank you for that, the organizers. Um, and I also just wanted to say, uh, you know, I, I wish I could stay for the entire event. This is um, not only of huge importance, but just even my own academic interests, it, it aligns beautifully. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to hear how it goes and I'll, I'll zoom in and out um, for the event. But what is really wonderful about it is the, um, the importance of bringing together two, two themes that we're just struggling with as a, as a, as a world, as a nation. Um, and that is, how do we take the knowledge gained from science and use it effectively um, to address some of these real big issues that we have? And then the, the other side of that is, how do we engage people in that so that they want to do the right thing? Right? And we can think about lots of environmental policies um, that were rational on one end, but really unproductive socially or culturally. So for example, redlining or um, some ideas around transportation that have really um, created a lot of environmental injustices. How can we at this point look at environmental policy in a, in a way that really shines a light on its implications on um, the disempowered, the people not around the table? Um, when I was in school, I was learning about, you know, uh, uh, messy problems, wicked, wicked problems, and things like that. Um, we are surrounded by wicked problems, and um, the only way to address them is to get people behind making change, and, and really that's where we have to really think through how we do policy. So, um, so I'm delighted to have this group here in really um, addressing those issues because, because we, we have so much knowledge here, so much knowledge being produced, um, and we really want to have an impact. So those are the kinds of things that we really need to address. So thank you very much for pulling this together. Um, have a wonderful day. And again, I'm looking forward to, to stepping in and out and, and watching everything as much as I can. So with that, I'll say goodbye. Thanks so much, Laura. You really hit on some of the key themes that we, as a conference organizing committee, were really interested in addressing um, in this workshop. So I first want to acknowledge the conference organizing committee in the Department of Human Ecology. So Rachel Schwamm has just done a ton of logistical work. Thank you so much, Rachel, for everything you've done. Karen O'Neill as well also in the Department of Human Ecology. Um, we have Vic Ramanzoni, who's here, um, and then Simi Payne, um, who is teaching this morning, um, has been instrumental in putting this all together. And our original thought, way back, we turned in this grain in February of 2020, not knowing everything that was about to happen, but our original thought was, 
um, to have a workshop that showcases what we already have at Rutgers in terms of people working on the Anthropocene, working on governance issues, working on science policy, um, but take that group and then imagine what we could be, what we could build here at Rutgers, um, new teaching, new research, maybe new institutional structures. So the workshop is sort of designed around those two goals. Um, and so today we're going to hear from esteemed international speakers who have, uh, we're very grateful that they've joined us um, to sort of stimulate our thinking on what are the big issues that we want to face here? What do we want to think about? Um, you know, things like how do we change institutional landscapes to be appropriate for Anthropocene challenges? You know, what are some emerging or novel mechanisms of governance that we're going to need going forward, knowing that our sort of previous siloed one policy, one institution solutions just have not worked for these complex problems of the Anthropocene? Um, and what are some synergistic and justice oriented future visions that we could implement that will take into account the need for dynamic science, but also equity focused solutions. So that was our goal for um, this grant and this workshop. We'll hear from our speakers today. We'll have Rutgers commentators for each of our speakers. And then tomorrow, I hope everyone can join us for that as well. Tomorrow is going to be very focused on how do we take all of these ideas that we've talked about today and put them into research practice. So we're going to talk um, with folks about maybe some research grants that we could put together. We'll have a panel on teaching. How can we expand our teaching on environmental governance? Where do we need to have those courses? What should they look like? Um, and then finally, the last roundtable tomorrow will be on, are you as an institution? You know, what do we need to build a center for environmental governance and climate and biodiversity and all of the things that we have strengths in? Um, and so we hope that you'll join us for that program tomorrow as well. So without further ado, I want to thank again um, our sponsors, RU Global, um, EOS, and RCI, um, and turn it over to Rachel, who is going to be moderating our first panel. So thank you. Thanks, Pam, for that uh, introduction and welcome. And we're all very happy to be here today. Um, our first panel is going to be on governing uncertainty and, and risk in the Anthropocene. And so I'm very happy to welcome Tyler Felgenhauer, uh, who's a research scientist with the Modeling Environmental Risks and Decision Group at Duke University. And he's a public policy social scientist who's kind of in um, an engineering department right now, so a, a kind of real model of that kind of interdisciplinary work we're hoping to encourage here. And uh, Tyler's research focuses on climate society systems and options for responding to climate change uh, risk in an integrated way and draws on approaches from systems analysis, modeling, decision analysis, and other analytical methods of public policy and economics. And uh, before Duke, Tyler was a social scientist with the Office of Research and Development at the US EPA and director with the clean energy finance firm, Iron Oak Energy. He has additional experience uh, with the International Institute for Applied Systems, RTI International, and the North Carol Carolina Institute for Climate Studies. He holds a PhD in public policy from UNC Chapel Hill, a master's in public and uh, international Affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton and a BA in Government from Cornell University. And so I'd like to uh, welcome Tyler now. Just coordinating my, uh, my separate laptop in this. Thank you all for having me. <clears throat> And thank you for the uh, for the invitation. Thank you to the organizing committee and the sponsors of this conference. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as Rachel said, I'm a public policy person who somehow ended up in an engineering school at Duke. But we're with the um, this group called the Duke Center on Risk, which is a cross university uh, group that's um, linking up different schools at, at Duke to look at areas of risk that are hard to analyze, whether it's from a legal perspective. An engineering perspective, a policy perspective. We've focused on 
um, such disparate risks as, as risk of asteroid or nuclear war, risks of going to Mars. And the study, my focus has been on the risks of, of uh, climate change and how we can, uh, can address them through different policy approaches in a policy portfolio, specifically now the, the risks and possible benefits of geoengineering the climate. <clears throat> Let's see where this goes. Uh, in this talk, I, I'm, I'm going to address four, four themes. First, um, four, four themes throughout, and it's based on a lot of my work over the past several years. First, the goals of climate change policy. It's important to, to remember what we are actually aiming for. So from an, an economist might say, what is the objective of our objective function? A uh, policy person might just say, what is our, what's the point of this? What are we actually trying to do? And I'm arguing that it's, it's to reduce overall risk, overall risks of climate change in a just way. Second, we can address climate change policy with a portfolio of, of uh, address climate change with a portfolio of approaches. And the question though is, is how to quote, optimize those, those policy choices. How do we allocate our limited policy resources across this, this um, set of, of options? where well, the options involve trade-offs and certainty decision-making over time, et cetera. Third, risks and, and their trade-offs in comparison, where risk at the basic level is the combination of a probability of an event and its negative consequences. I'll talk more about these trade-offs and comparisons. And then finally, the governance, uh, the governance which, which is defined there, as you can read it, but I prefer to, to talk about it, to think about it in terms of the decision-making. And it reminds me of, of uh, what my, my son, Scott, master used to yell after after young early teenage boys would leave on, on scout trips he would say make good decisions and I, I started yelling that after my kids when they would, would go off on their own make good decisions that's that's what I see as the prime goal of governance um, among among the other um, needs listed there so this is the well-known Keeling curve um, might be the only one that's immortalized in in a plaque. This is the these this is, represents the problem of climate change, the ever rising um, concentration in the atmosphere of, of carbon dioxide through time. This is this is it continues to rise past the date here. I won't go into the into the other graphs showing the the dire situation we have with climate change, the forest fires in the West, the the tragedy currently going on in Pakistan with over a thousand, close to uh, fifteen hundred, maybe two thousand people dead, and a third of the country affected the heat wave in Europe, except we can go on and on, just read the newspaper for the effects of climate change and the need to address it now. This is a framing, uh, this, and this is how I, this is kind of the, the, the framework of the entire talk of, of how we can see um, <clears throat> the causes and, and the um, ways we can address climate change. So moving from left to right, economic activity, uh, we know, um, it causes greenhouse gas emissions, rising concentrations, radiative forcing on the planet, and, and eventually causes climate impacts, whether they're temporary damages or permanent losses. <clears throat> um, there's, a, there's a negative feedback to uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm coordinating between the two. There's a negative feedback between those losses and the economic activity. And uh, emissions and concentrations also have their negative side effects as well that we might want to consider when we're addressing climate change. And then in the far bottom right, we have our goals. What goals do we want to achieve when we're trying to address climate change? Well, we have a, a, a series of possible goals, the ones that have been politically agreed to internationally, the UNFCCC in 1992, the Paris um, 1.5 or 2 degree temperature goals. We might have sustainable development goals in there. You might have a specific goal, such as sea level rise, or other economic goals, such as minimizing the global da the damages to net social discounted welfare. Other climatic goals you could fit in there as well. <clears throat> so we have a we have a set of policies that we can address these these challenges with. And mitigation here obviously goes to greenhouse gas emissions. That's anything to reduce our emissions of of gases before they, they hit the atmosphere. We can have carbon dioxide removal. <clears throat> I'm just going to... Um, anything to, to, to take that carbon dioxide out of the air once it's, once it's there. 
And these are often um, grouped together, uh, but, uh, but obviously they're two very different types of policies but different, very different types of risks. But they're often grouped together because, because they work on the same, um, th the same goal, reducing the, the concentrations of, uh, re reducing carbon dioxide, whether it's emitted or concentrated and then pulled out of the atmosphere. And then we have adaptation, which is now the this, this second major um, policy approach to deal with the damages as they occur or before they occur or after they occur. And what I've been looking at a lot lately is solar geoengineering, a third major family of approaches that would deal with the, the radiative forcing methods to increase the reflectivity of the Earth and give us a little bit of time to get our act together on the mitigation side. <clears throat> so a brief um, introduction to solar geoengineering. Um, the idea is to, to increase the reflectivity of the Earth, um, and the chart here is from the recent National Academies of Sciences report. L they looked at um, three primary methods. One would be stratospheric aerosol injection, injecting sulfate aerosols in the high, in the high um, atmosphere, in the stratosphere, with specially modified planes to reflect um, part of the incoming solar radiation the second method might be down lower at, with marine cloud brightening that, that would um, involve brightening the clouds at the marine level. A third, le a third approach might be serious cloud thinning, which technically isn't solar radiation management, it's earth radiation management. You would open up the clouds and let more heat out. So focusing specifically on stratospheric aerosol injection, we know it, it would be cheap um, relative to mitigation. A few billion dollars sounds expensive, but relative to mitigation, it'd be extremely cheap. We, we expect that it would be fast and effective at, at slowing temperature rise or even stabilizing it if we used enough of it. We also expect that it would be imperfect. Um, it's not climate change in reverse. It's an additional and new type of climate change that you're imposing on the, on the, on the uh, Earth. It's highly uncertain. And if we were ever to do it, we would need a lot more research than is done, being done now. Um, it, it's temporary in that the stratospheric injections need to be repeated over time because the, the aerosols precipitate out. And it's also um, temporary in the sense that it only addresses the symptoms and not the actual causes of climate change. Um, it's truly a, a Band-Aid solution, but, but we use Band-Aids because they work. And so it, it could, it's worthy of further research to see if, it's, if, if it makes sense to pursue um, a little bit further. Um, and finally, risky, highly, highly risky because we haven't never done such a thing before. So theme one the, on the goals of policy, the proposition here is that the chosen policy objective will, will determine the optimal response. <clears throat> and so going back to the goal here of, of the UNFCCC, this is the uh, one thing that I, I just realized, this, this is already 30 years old, a, a climate policy goal is 30 years old. Um, and it, this is the key section which you may all, all already be familiar with, but it's focusing on stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions greenhouse gas concentrations in order to prevent these damages. And so these might be, these areas would be addressed by mitigation. These areas might be addressed by, by adaptation. And now we have solar geoengineering, which will do nothing for the concentrations, but it could also address some, of, some parts of these goals. And now fast forward in time, when we have the Paris Agreement on Climate Change um, from 2015, where the goal there is it's focused on temperature. It also has um, language on adaptation and emissions as well. But the, the premise here is that, you know, given that the UNFCCC uh, goal, goals were, are, so, uh, are 30 years old and we have not done enough to, to address them, um, mitigation and adaptation, it, it's questionable whether mitigation alone with, with carbon dioxide removal can actually get to those 1.5 temperature goals. Solar geoengineering might be needed to help us achieve the Paris goals. Um, I, I didn't mean to go, to go forward. Um, the, the theme number two, I'll just read it. Um, how do we allocate our limited resources across a policy response portfolio? So the proposition I would, I would put forth is that an optimal climate change policy will include mitigation, CDR, adaptation, and possibly the addition of some small part of some portion of it being addressed by solar geoengineering. And the, the allocation across these policies 
both in near term and long term, will depend on the types of strategies and their characteristics, their effectiveness, their lifetimes, their limits, the interactions between these, all these strategies, and uncertainty and learning about how they actually work. So what we see here is the, the well-known napkin diagram from Shepard, um, which came out of the Asilomar conference um, 12 years ago, um, which uh, Alan was at. Um, the, the idea is here that on the left, on the, on the y-axis, we have temperature and global warming and time on the on the uh, x-axis um it can uh, the damages of global warming can be solved through you know mitigation of some combination of cdr what you see there is srm solar radiation management which is some uh, which is characterized as this peak shaving where we would use a little bit of it over time to to maintain some sort of temperature balance here it's represented at two where we want to stay below the two degree threshold the rest of the damages are addressed through adaptation. And of course, the residual, which we cannot mitigate, which we cannot adapt to, is suffering, suffering through climate change. So one, one approach to, one approach to looking at these trade-offs between policies is, some, is, use, is modeling. And I, I show this not to, to go through the entire graph, but just, just to introduce the idea of the integrated assessment model. This is um, called DICE, the Dynamic Integrated Climate and Economy Model. And it, it allows for uh, relatively accessible um, alterations in the model to look at how policies might change over time. And so the idea is that the two gray diamonds are your choice variables. You choose to invest, you choose to mitigate. It affects the, the, the economy and then affects the climate, and then there's the feedback from climate damages. And so you choose what you want to mitigate over time, and you're optimizing here. You're trying to maximize the bold rectangle at the bottom left, the total net social discounted social total net discounted social welfare. And so some so it's relatively straightforward to add some sort of adaptation variable in there as an as an additional choice variable. This again is, um, uh, I actually wanted to step back. There are a few caveats about DICE. Uh, the, the results I'm presenting here are, are frankly out of date and old, but, but they show important trade-offs and directions of variables, directions of results. Second, there are a lot of um, critiques of DICE and they're well known that it doesn't discount, um, the, it discounts the future much more heavily than it should. It's, um, it's looking at some sort of hypothetical optimal global policymaker who makes decisions for the entire globe. It doesn't have catastrophic, the risk of catastrophic climate change in there. Um, so there are well-known critiques. And it's also, it's been used for the, to calculate the social cost of carbon as well, but, net, but it seems to be on its way out. However, it still provides some lessons in terms of, from a public policy perspective, what is, uh, we're well aware of all the ways that DICE results can go wrong or ways that human behavior is not characterized by this. But from a policy perspective, the idea is to first at least show the, the idealized world and then work backwards and say, well, that idealized world doesn't work, of course, but what's the ideal? And then we can compare and contrast and see, well, well, it doesn't account for this, it doesn't account for that, it doesn't account for human behavior and justice and distribution and all that. Um, so these are some, hypo some basic optimal results. Um, if you if you have on the left a, a no mitigation, no adaptation business as usual case, these are the net damages over time. And then the second scenario is, a, is an optimal mitigation with no adaptation. You see that the total cost of climate change dropped um, fairly significantly and the mitigation cost is minimal compared with the, with the amount of damages still. In the third, in the third situation, we, we, we assume Uh, it's not clicking. Okay. Uh, this is, a, again, a hypothetical where the world decides not to mitigate, but just adapt our way out of, out of it. And interestingly, the DICE model says that that might actually be better. I don't agree with that, but um, these are just Ill illustrative results. Am I supposed to point this way? Or? Okay. Are you able to advance? Okay. Thanks. 
Okay. Okay. Anyway, the punchline is that that the the use of both policies over time is is our, our best approach. You can use you can use this type of modeling approach to compare different strategies over time, um, and the interactions with with each other. So on the left we have a situation where in the red line we have just a mitigation, an optimal mitigation path. What the model says is the best approach for to improve social welfare the most, and then you add adaptation and it actually reduces our need for mitigation. Um, adaptation, on the other hand, is less sensitive to the addition of mitigation. Primarily because um, it, it acts on a short-term basis, whereas mitigation is acting on, on a 30 or 40, 50 year scale. Um, it's showing that, again, while I don't, uh, we wouldn't, these are for um, illustrative purposes only, we don't want to uh, show that we, we don't want, we, we don't agree with these results that, that we, we don't have to mitigate as much with adaptation, but it shows that um, there are trade-offs between the two policies. I mean, right now, the op we're, we're suboptimal on both right now, as, as we speak right now. You can look at the two policies uh, under uncertainty as well, where um, you, you might have this hypothetical national policy decision to decide how much, you, say, you have a limited amount of money to, to, to a to look at adaptation versus mitigation. And you can actually go through the US federal budget and try to calculate, well, how much are we devoting to mitigation, to adaptation, to geoengineering? And then you can learn in the next period, well, how serious is climate change, and then revise your decisions. This is just a simple Bayesian, uh, Bayesian approach. And so here we have our optimal um, mitigation path under climate sensitivity, uh, under, a, under, a, under a certain climate sensitivity. And here it is when we, we have this ability to learn about how serious climate change is. So in, in this period, again, these are older results, but you can, you can move this period, the timeline forward. In this period, you have no knowledge of climate change, so you don't mitigate at all. You gain some knowledge of, of some future expected climate sensitivity, but you don't know how, how serious climate change is. And then you learn how, how serious climate change is. And if it's very serious, you ramp up your mitigation. If it's less serious than you thought, you might, you might um, cut back on it. And we're in the, actually in the process now of learning that climate change is ever more serious with each, each learning period. The same can be done with adaptation. And then the two can be shown together, the point of which is not to look at the actual um, the numbers, but to look at the spreads. So, this is logical in that it shows that mitigation would be much more sensitive um, to our, our knowledge of how damaging the future climate is. Rel yeah. Yes. Um, so in, these are these are relative levels of effort. Um, so the mitigation is is your your amount that you cut on emissions, and the uh, and adaptation is is a is actually. It's a separate um, y-axis, but it's the amount of damages that are reduced um, each period. How much it makes sense to, to invest in adaptation? It's the percent of, uh, of gross damages that are, that are or net damages after mitigation. Um, that is one issue with, with incorporating these two variables so, um, on the same axis, because what we're, what we're showing here is just relative effort, not um, not spending on, on the effort. I know there's some challenges with that. Um, we could look at different types of adaptation. Uh, we, could, we could imagine flow adaptation where it's less expensive and ephemeral. Um, it's more flexible to the damages that as we face them. Uh, there's, on the other hand, there's long-lived adaptation stock. You think of a seawall or such as this uh, Maslunkerten, if I'm pronouncing it right. Maslant current was storm surge barrier in the Netherlands, which is a massive storm gate the size of a couple of football fields that's been put in to adapt to sea level surge. Um, and then you can imagine a third level of, uh, of a third type of, of adaptation called option stock, where you're investing in, in future adaptation 
now on the expectation that damages will rise, but you're not actually spending the money now. So the analogy, um, the imperfect analogy would be building a, a seawall that is ready to be added on to later. And that's actually what is happening in a treasure island in San Francisco. Um, it allows for you to spend money later when you see that the damages are higher. If they're not higher, then you don't have to invest as much. So we have, um, I'll skip this in the interest of time. We also look at, at the limits to adaptation. So for here, um, and this is some of the final model results, I promise. The, we have, uh, on the left here, we have adaptation levels divided into how much you want to invest in flow adaptation and how much you want to invest in stock adaptation. Um, and there's some, substitute, some substitutability between the two. And then we have our optimal mitigation. So what happens then when the flow adaptation just stops working? So you can imagine a beach renourishment program, the sea level rises to such an extent that the adding more and more sand just stops working. What happens to our overall policy mix? Well, in this, in this um, case, because there's less substitutability between the adaptations, the, the, uh, the, slack, the slack is actually taken up by mitigation. When there's more substitutability between the two adaptation types, <clears throat> the flow stops working, the, flow, the temporary uh, repeated adaptation stops working, and that's more long-term adaptation. Mitigation changes a lot less. I'll skip through that. That's the option stock um, calculation. So theme three on risks, um, comparisons, and trade-offs. The propositions here are that none of these policies is without risks. Each will be aimed at a target risk, but also come with countervailing risks, a risk-risk trade-off. The total risks of all policies within a scenario's portfolio need to be compared to those, um, to, to the policies in a different scenario's portfolio. So all these policies have risk. Um, there are countervailing risks of mitigation, as we know, I'll focus, I'll just mention a couple um, here later. So nuclear power obviously has its risk with waste accidents, the risk of, of using natural gas as a bridge fuel, the risk of biofuels. Solar and wind have their own negative side effects. Um, carbon sequestration and storage, electric vehicles also have their negative side effects, especially with mining of lithium. CDR has come under, under um, scrutiny for its risks that it would, it would pose, whether, you know, so here's the, all the, this list of carbon dioxide removal technologies. And they all, to some extent or another, might have some sort of air pollution, water pollution, mining impacts, effects on biodiversity, et cetera. Soil carbon sequestration here is shown with an asterisk because according to the IPCC report here, uh, it's actually one of the few that actually has no large side effects. It actually improves the soils and also um, helps with our sequestration. Um, add, to the, add to the nuclear, I never thought in my life that there would be a nuclear power plant that's in a war zone. So now we have the additional risk that a nuclear power plant gets attacked in the middle of a war. This is the, Europe's largest. This is in the news daily. This is a, the Zaporizhia plant in Ukraine. On biofuels, this is some work that we did at the EPA a few years ago using the Markal um, model, looking at energy supply within the US economy. And so we look at, at this this uh, chart shows a particular scenario where we forced the U.S. Um, forced the model to cut its overall energy emissions. So that includes electricity as well as fuels um, by 40 percent, and then also forced the model to electrify half of the light-duty vehicle fleet. And so what we see here is is a large portion of of the um, carbon um, cut comes from the use of biofuels in the in the green from the Midwest flowing to other parts of the country. This, these, this shows transfers in terms of pedigules, so biofuels and different electricity transfers. So this might be all well and good, but we know that biofuels has a huge uh, water impact. So all of, that, all of those new biofuels would have huge implications of water transfers from the Midwest outward, depending on, on um, how the water for the biofuels is sourced. And that's not even talking about the land and food price interactions as well with biofuels. So this is, how do we depict these risks? This is one of the most um, well-known ones, the, the so-called burning ember from the IPCC reports, where 
going from bottom to top, we have some sort of you know, white undetectable risk all the way up to purple, which is very high and severe risk that are very hard to adapt to. And then those burning embers can be applied to different, different sectors that we might want to predict, might want to protect from warm water corals on the left, mangroves, um, crop yields, etc. And then on the y-axis is shown the temperature uh, at which those risks start to, at, at each risk rises different, at different rates with different temperature rises. And we see that warm water corals are the ones that are, might be one of, at one of the most highest risks right now, uh, as well as coastal flooding. So mitigation, um, this isn't actually the, the time of mitigation, but this is showing that mitigation will, will lower those risks in, in mitigating and preventing a rise above two degrees and stabilizing with mitigation alone. We could, we could prevent all of those risks above the green line. So here's a situation where we, we might be able only to mitigate to two. We prevent those um, at some point in the future. And now we have the option of geoengineering where we, we might you know, have the goal of mitigating to two and then use the geoengineering for an additional half a degree. Um, where geoengineering can lower f the climate change risks we expect. However, it has additional countervailing risks that we are unfamiliar with, but we expect to be prevalent. So in these, in these shaded areas on, on the left, those risks of climate change are eliminated with geoengineering or, or alleviated, but yet we have new risks from geoengineering. I'll skip this. this and so we have what's called a risk trade-off, but I'll go through it here with, with this chart. Basically, the, the idea again is that every policy has its risks. So the goal of the policy is in the green um, box, upper left, um, box A. You're trying to reduce the target risk. You're trying to reduce climate change risk. Going down, um, each policy might have some co-benefits, but those probably are, are not part of your, they could be part of your calculation, but they're not the focus. They're not the reason you, do a, you implement a policy. You don't implement a policy for the co-benefits. You implement a policy for the benefits. Then going on the negative side, there might be some, some uh, perverse outcomes in C where in implementing the policy, you're actually making things worse. And then in D, the lower right, those are the countervailing risks. Those are what you would call side effects. And so for solar geoengineering, uh, just briefly, it's expected that solar geoengineering and stabilizing or reducing the t stabilizing temperatures or reducing the, the rise in temperature could alleviate most or uh, uh, many climate change impacts. That's, that's the target risk. The co-benefits of solar geoengineering are too small to even mention. It's something like, you know, um, more beautiful sunsets, but we would never do the, we would never do solar geoengineering for that again. Um, C is, is, is challenging because it's, again, a different type of climate change. Um, there, might, there might be many areas of the world that are, that are, where their um, temperature variability or their climate variability is, is, is stabilized through solar geoengineering, but other parts of the world where it gets worse. And that's not what we want. That's where solar geoengineering is make thing, making things worse than climate change would have. And then focusing here, though, on, on, on D, this is where, where the, the interesting risks are, the countervailing risks, new risks um, to biophysical systems and social systems. On the biophysical side, this is some, um, from some work that um, we did with the Carnegie Climate Governance um, Initiative, C2G, looking at risk-risk trade-offs. We were arguing that a lot of the, the biophysical, well, just summarizing the literature, um, you know, there, there's serious concerns about increased acid deposition in pristine areas. There's going to be an effect on stratospheric ozone with stratospheric aerosol injection. There'd be an effect with light dimming and diffusion with uncertain effects on agriculture. The, with marine cloud brightening, there might be an increase in salt deposition over land. On the right, though, are the ones that I've been focusing on lately, it, are the, which may be the most serious because we don't, it's not something you can actually model. You have to look through it with scenario analysis or, or role play exercises. Um, there's a worry that it, in, the, with, if solar geoengineering was so effective, it might reduce our incentive to mitigate the so-called moral hazard. 
The second one is the one I'm working on in project with uh, resources for the future, looking at the risks of international conflict, where, where if some country decides to start solar geoengineering and other countries are opposed, that could actually lead to war. Um, skipping the volcano one, there's also the shock of sudden termination. If for some reason this, we become addicted to solar geoengineering and for, if for some reason it suddenly stops due to, due to um, social factors, that would cause a huge rise, a rapid rise in temperatures and an ecological catastrophe. Um, and then, then of course there's effects, um, um, concerns, ethical concerns in general, but then specific concerns about uh, procedural and distributional justice. Um, so we see that the risks, geoengineering risks are, are determined by the deployment scenario and its governance. But we can also see that we, could, we can start to learn about these risks and see how they would be managed. So here's a risk trade-off with solar geoengineering and mitigation. So here's your target climate change risk and increasing levels of, of SAI, stratospheric aerosol injection on the, on the x-axis um, would reduce um, would be reduced, the climate change risks are reduced. However, solar radiation management also comes with its own ancillary risks. And so if this is the curve, then we, we would, we would uh, choose there. However, we don't know what the shape of the curve is for the ancillary risks of solar geoengineering. If it's there, um, which of these curves and, and trying to determine what this so-called this hypothetical risk curve for solar geoengineering is is very challenging. The lesson here though is that if you don't like solar geoengineering, which I don't like it either, but I, I don't like climate change even worse. Um, if you want to if you want to avoid using high levels of solar geoengineering, you can mitigate more now and, and you won't need as much if you want to stabilize at a particular temperature. So uh, finally, the theme on, on governance. Um, we, need, we will need new mechanisms to, to manage the risks of, of solar geoengineering. I think that's, that's clear. Um, there have been a number of studies kind of surveying the lay of the land on what is in existence right now in terms of international environmental agreements from the, um, from the NMOD on, on uh, environmental modification techniques to, to the Vienna Convention on, on uh, the ozone layer. Um, to outer space treaties, to the Antarctic treaty system. Uh, there's a range, there are whole books written on surveys looking at, well, how might that apply? And when I was at the EPA, uh, it was actually nine years ago, we were looking at how might the Clean Air Act apply to solar geoengineering and the EPA, because the EPA had never thought of that. Um, I still think they're, they're still thinking about how it might apply. There's an interesting new approach now that just started in the past few months, this global commission on governing risks from climate overshoot. Shoot. So it's a, it's a commission model, and sometimes commissions turn into conventions or even protocols. So um, that's a that's a new development on the on the bottom there. Still, though, there's no international um, laws or policy um, or domestic policy statements that are directly applicable to geoengineering. There's a there's a few with the with the biodiversity convention, but um, nothing nothing of note that would actually change countries' decisions. So surveying this literature, that there's several themes. Um, you know, one is, it, these are fairly obvious, to, uh, adopt a series of, of um, principles, best practices, codes of conduct, norms, treat it as a, as a public good under government authority, not private, um, have that governance in place before any deployment happens, um, have rules on what's allowed in terms of amounts, um, tr transparency, in, independence, oversight of impacts, public participation, stakeholder participation, um, one one piece we looked at earlier was was treating solar geoengineering not as a not as a policy approach, but it itself as an emerging risk that itself needs oversight. And then, so getting back to my my view, my 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 presentation of governance, where it, where it's where might our decisions go wrong? Um, and these are just these are just some you know there are many ways that decisions can go wrong. These are these are ones that are just thrown out here, possibly for discussion. Um, so for mitigation, CDR, adaptation, and solar geoengineering, it's all possible to choose the wrong technology. We could be choosing, um, we could be investing in technology that won't work in 10 years or, or we find in 10 years we over-invested in that technology when we should have waited 10 years. Um, well, not wait, but we should have invested in the new technology instead. 
um, all of these have that problem of just choosing the wrong technology when a, a better one might come along soon. With adaptation to solar geoengineering, you could choose the wrong amount of effort. Um, it's hard to choose the wrong amount of effort with mitigation CDR. We know that we need to do much more. Um, with adaptation, I bring up the example of, uh, again, the tragedies in Pakistan, where apparently some of the bridges that were washed out were, were just 10 years old and were actually built to climate resilient standards, and they were washed out. So those bridges were supposedly an adaptation for climate change in the future. They're washed out. That was a, that was a wrong amount of effort, that they were not built to withstand even higher damages than they should have been. Um, with solar geoengineering, it, it'll be very, it would be very tricky. Um, the, this challenge of, of cooling, uh, cooling too much or cooling not enough. And um, there, there are all the different issues about um, how countries would decide on what the proper temperature for the globe is. It's called the global thermostat problem where different countries have different preferences on what, what amount they might want for solar geoengineering. And then finally for solar geoengineering, this notion of mistaken early cancellation, and it deals with the uncertainty question as well. So responsible deployment, if that were ever to occur, would not happen suddenly, like the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1981. It would happen gradually, where you gradually start emitting some of these particles in the stratosphere, start to measure what happens, and gradually um, ramp it up and tweak and learn what happens. However, in that period of gradual ramp up, whether it lasts 10 or 15 years or more, uh, there, there will still be climate variability that will, will affect the, the globe that's separate from the solar geoengineering's effect. And so it, it, we could have the mistaken signal that, um, you know, we're starting to geoengineer and a climate catastrophe happens, and that's um, misattributed to the solar geoengineering. And then there's a political backlash where the solar geoengineering is canceled, when in effect, when, when, in, when in truth, the solar geoengineering was working uh, as intended, it just takes a lot longer to implement. So we're, we're working on a project on, um, on termination shock, and, and we're also, and one, there's the termination shock problem what, where you have a, a, an established solar geoengineering program what, that suddenly stops. What are the incentives for countries to not allow that to happen? But then there's also the termination question at the, in the early periods when it's seen as a highly risky approach that could work or couldn't work, we don't know yet. Um, the risk is that if, if it was to work well, the, uh, the risk is that we cancel it um, too early before we find out more. Finally, um, when I talk to, geo talk to people about geoengineering, um, this is the most common um, phrase in response, and I agree, geoengineering sounds risky. It is, for sure, it would be. Uh, but the appropriate comparison should be made, but so is climate change. Uh, the appropriate comparison should be made between these two hypothetical policy portfolios. So A, you have the, your costs of mitigation, it's a monetary costs of mitigation, CDR and adaptation, and the risks and side effects of all those policies, and you get the benefit of lowered climate change impacts. That portfolio should be compared against an alternate policy portfolio where you have the original policies you add solar geoengineering, and you add its risks and side effects. The question is, is it worth it to, do, to assume those new risks if the benefits of solar geoengineering allow for much lower climate change impacts? Um, in conclusion, uh, these are some of, the, some of the work projects we're doing on, uh, we're working on right now. We're working with NSF on how to understand the free driver motivation, that's the notion that a country would, would want to unilaterally implement geoengineering. Um, but we're working with the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment on, on how to conceptualize different geoengineering pathways for, so policymakers can actually think about these questions. Um, with RFF, I'm, I'm excited to be working on this project on international security implications of geoengineering, which I personally think are the, are the, uh, the highest risks. I think the, risks are the, the highest risk of geoengineering comes from an international conflict or, a, or an implementation, a deployment without proper governance, kind of a rogue actor. Um, well, not a rogue actor. It would, it would be a rogue actor, but it could be a big rogue actor like the US or China um, doing it on its own. Um, and then finally, working on some, um, looking at the state of research across the globe um, on solar geoengineering. I talked about the Duke Center on risk, and this is our team. Thank you very much. I'm happy to have questions.
Sorry, I was thinking I could just go back to my seat. Um, so we have uh, three commentators uh, coming up. We've asked them to reflect on how Tyler's talk on risk governance um, relates to the research that they do. Uh, and first up, we have uh, Dr. Bob Kopp, uh, climate science researcher here at Rutgers, um, and who's uh, calling in. So go ahead, Bob. and. Um, We'll give you five to six minutes. Great. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for reminding me. Sorry I'm not there in person. This, I was hoping to, to be there. It's just turned into one of these days where I have to zoom to several places simultaneously. Um, but I will be in and out. Um, and um, I'm really excited about this discussion, which is really close to my heart. Um, you know, Rachel and I taught a course on governing long-term risks about five or six years ago. Um, I'm teaching two related courses in uh, the spring um, on one undergraduate class on solving the climate crisis and one my graduate seminar on climate change risk analysis. So the sort of framing of the problem as risk analysis and risk management problem that problem uh, where uh, you know where my own research goes it sort of starts with okay we can learn a lot from these sorts of abstractions and high level thinking about structure problems. Um, you know, I've done work with DICE and played around with it uh, and published some stuff on it. But at some point we also need to cross check what we learn from those against the complexities and the messiness of the real world. Um, and I think a, a, a um, lesson uh, for those of us who are sort of operate personally in the climate econ space uh, from this year is the question of well, why did this first best uh, climate policy of national carbon pricing, you know, be something that we've banged our head against for 25 years, whereas a messier politically economy driven solution like the Inflation Reduction Act be the thing that finally got national climate legislation um, over the finish line. Um, so I want to briefly talk about, and I'll make sure I can share my slides, about two uh, teams I'm involved with uh, that are united by the common theme of sort of getting some of this real world messiness into how we think about uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, so one of those uh, the, uh, projects, which I'm only going to talk about briefly, is sort of how we improve that sort of analysis and things like DICE and its descendant models by basing our estimates of the impacts of climate change on real world data. Um, and this sort of goal uh, is the goal of a, a collaboration I have co-led for the last seven years, the, the Climate Impact Lab, which is a partnership among Rutgers, Berkeley, Chicago, University of Chicago, and Rhodium Group. Um, that's really focused on integrating climate economics, data science, and uh, climate science uh, to learn about things like how people in the real world at mass scale, so using large data sets, uh, respond uh, to weather and climate shock. So how does um, exposure to extreme temperature affect mortality and labor productivity and crop yield and, and other factors? And how do people respond to that? So how do those responses differ uh, based on people's uh, uh, income and based on uh, the climate that they're, they're used to? And how can we use this information together with climate projections to put things like the social cost of carbon on a more robust empirical foundation while also asking questions about things like the distributional effects of climate impacts and the costs of climate adaptation. So that's one project we're involved in. The main one I wanted to talk about in my, in my little time is a new project we started last year with NSF support, um, the Megalopolitan, Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub, which I direct and is a partnership of about 12 institutions led out of Rutgers. Um, sort of inspired, um, actually inspired by the thoughts which also underlie this sort of key message from the IPCC uh, Working Group 2 report about sea level rise and coastal change and the distinctiveness of the adaptation challenge posed by coastal change, uh, which essentially arises from a few factors. So number one, uh, sea level long-term on sort of multi-decadal scale sea level um, rise projections are characterized by deep uncertainty, meaning there are uh, processes 
within the ice sheet climate system that can lead to very extreme outcomes in terms of sea level rise, and that we aren't in a place where we can really put probabilities on those, even though we we are in a place where we start uh, needing to be making decisions that are affected by those potential high-end outcomes. Uh, And there's a portfolio of different adaptation options. So this is really, as I'm a little bit going into that one adaptation bucket uh, that Tyler was looking at and and looking at this in detail on the graph. Um, The IPCC message, which although it postdates our our proposal, really could be taken as an inspiration for MUC, is that responses to sea level rise are more effective if they're combined, sequenced, planned well ahead as a network of contingencies aligned with sociocultural values and development priorities and underpinned by inclusive community engagement processes. Um, So uh, MOC is working with communities and decision makers and stakeholders across our region, uh, places like Camden, uh, in Gloucester City, Philadelphia, New York City. We're, We're still in early sort of discussions with these, but that's sort of looking like where we're narrowing down on to one, because it's NSF, advance the fundamental understanding of the coupled uh, coastal natural human system while also helping these communities develop flexible, equitable, and robust long-term planning to manage climate risk and building a model for how academic institutions can partner with stakeholders to advance just equitable and inclusive climate action in diverse coastal urban mega regions around the world. Um, so this requires a transdisciplinary approach going from understanding the physical hazards to the engineering on the ground of what's exposed and vulnerable to the social science of what's on the ground to the social dynamics of how household decision makings and markets and municipal finances interact to affect the efficacy of adaptation offense. And doing this in a framing that is informed by the real world challenge of actually helping communities do things like Uh, produce redevelopment plans that will inform how they try to grow over the next several decades. Um, This is a figure showing the arm vision of this complex system. It's sort of analogous to that DICE systems diagram, uh, except that each of these is going to have, you know, has more complex representations than the single equation that's in DICE. But fundamentally, this is a complex integrated system, and we need that approach. And we need to develop this in a manner that that co-produced with stakeholders, where we're making sure that we are asking questions in a manner that can inform the decisions they're actually facing and is viewed by them as credible uh, and legitimate as well as relevant. Um, and that, that's the end. And I, I managed to use up all of my time. Thank you, Rachel, for the notification. Thanks, Bob. That last diagram really cleared everything up for us. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, thank you. And so now I'm going to ask um, Ellen Robach to, to come up and uh, give his reaction to this. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to follow up with what uh, Tyler said. Uh, So I've been working on this topic, stratospheric geoengineering, for more than a decade. I went to the 2010 Asilomar Conference on geoengineering, where Rob Sokolow, a Princeton professor, went around and asked people, what's the worst that could possibly happen if we do this? And on Friday, he reported his result, which was global nuclear war, which is what Tyler said, conflict between how do we set the planetary thermostat. This is how we used to set thermostats. And... uh, so uh, something else I'd like to reflect on, uh, Tyler said it's cheap, uh, but it's never, it can't be done today because the technology doesn't exist. We can't create a cloud in the stratosphere. There are some airplanes on the drawing board, but none of them have been built. And at a conference, uh, a Gordon Research Conference a month ago, I asked Wake Smith, who's working on that, how long would it take to actually do it? Well, it would take a decade at least, but we haven't started yet. So maybe sometime in the future, and it remains to be determined whether it would be cheap and whether it would be easy and whether you could create a cloud like you like. Maybe you can go to the next slide. So I've, the first conference I went to, I wrote down 20 reasons why geoengineering might be a bad idea. I published that. And since then, I've been refining the list, and now I've got up to 28 reasons why it might be a 
a bad idea, risks and concerns, and of course, a list of benefits. And the number one benefit, as Tyler mentioned, is you can reduce the impacts of global warming. Somebody told me recently I should probably add that number one up there and make it bigger so, so uh, you have more things on that list, but you're not meant to count them. And we evaluate these with climate models and with volcanic eruptions, but the ones in the orange are ones that cannot be tested with this kind of research. So maybe go to the next slide, which is my last one. Uh, and I've just sort of blown up some of the things which I, I, I'm no expert on governance. I'm a climate scientist, I'm a meteorologist, but these are the things I think about. Uh, what if uh, big companies got involved and wanted to keep doing it no matter what, which is the problem with the military right now, the military industrial complex, they build something in every, in every district. Uh, why would it be hard to stop? And uh, what happens if you, as Tyler mentioned, you do it and most of the world is better off, but some people in the world are worse off. How do you compensate them? And the other problem is chaos. You don't know who they are. So the, there's natural variability. Every time there's a flood or a drought, you damn geoengineers, you did it. You have to compensate me for it. And you, you say, well, it's statistical. We can't prove that, that, that it wouldn't have happened otherwise. I think that's a governance problem, which is going to be very hard to solve. What global entity is going to be responsible for uh, deciding and compensating people who are negatively affected? I, I don't know how to solve that problem. And uh, the moral hazard. So uh, you mentioned if we think it's going to solve the problems, well, it won't work as hard toward mitigation. But people, there, uh, there was something on the other side which it might be better. Like people say to you, "What do you I mean? What do you work on?" Well, I work on geoengineering. What's that? Well, we're going to fly an airplane over your daughter's school. We're going to spray sulfuric acid in the air, and that's going to solve the problem of global warming. <laughs> and they say, "What?" You're serious? If you're actually thinking about something like that, maybe global warming is more serious than I've taken it. Maybe I should work harder on mitigation. So it could work the other way too. Those are just my thoughts. Have I finished in five minutes? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alan. And last but not least, we have uh, Aaron Martin, who uh, is one of our graduate students over in sociology, who's been um, working with me on, on some issues. And he's going to give his thoughts in regards to this uh, risk governance. Thanks, uh, Tyler, for those remarks and the, and the chance to engage with them. Um, I know very little about solar geoengineering, uh, but framing it as a risk problem um, is applicable to my work. So my research is most broadly um, about the role of organizations in uh, governing extreme risk, uh, certainly environmental risk, but also other large scale risks as well, um, and how organizations and institutions assess uncertainty uh, related to extreme risk. Um, so within the, uh, the arrangement of actors and processes uh, that guide our, our collective um, activities to regulate and to, to manage risk, organizations are an important site of action um, and, and you know, too often inaction or at least insufficient action uh, to address extreme risk. So I'm interested in both how individuals positioned within organizations uh, navigate organizational dynamics and, and uh, constraints to influence or inform um, organizational processes to address extreme risk. And related to that, how uh, organizations shape the larger, shape and influence the larger uh, socio-political context that uh, individuals and groups of people use uh, and draw on um, to understand and to make decisions related to extreme risk. Um, so in the, in the interdisciplinary spirit of the day, as Rachel mentioned, um, we're working on a project with uh, some folks from Northeastern and George Washington, a psychologist and a political scientist. Um, and the project looks at extreme weather events, um, which are characterized by, by complexity and uncertainty. And I think an important question that impacts how we think about uh, governing knowledge and uncertainty is, uh, is how non-experts 
um, navigate or sift through the, the multiplicity of considerations in order to arrive at understandings uh, of, of extreme risk and then make decisions based on those understandings. And so we know that that individual and collective responses to, uh, extreme, uh, to extreme weather events, to the climate crisis, depend on how people uh, understand and attribute uh, extreme events, how they uh, assign blame and responsibility for the causes and impacts of those events, and then ultimately whether or not they think their actions matter. Um, and so individuals have to disentangle um, the causal influence of, of a variety of different factors um, that inform extreme weather events and their associated uncertainty, um, which leads to many plausible interpretations of the, of the same event. Um, and what this does is it creates the conditions for uh, influential actors and organizations to shift or displace um, blame for causing or driving those risks. Um, and the idea is that, that in context of uncertainty, the system systematic and strategic shifting of blame uh, and responsibility um, enables the, the behaviors and the actions that drive a particular risk to continue unchallenged or un interrupted, um, which leads to the, the sort of the maintenance of the, the status quo, which is, you know, inaction or at least insufficient action. Um, and I think this is especially true for extreme risks where uncertainty is exacerbated by uh, the long timescales that these risks develop over, um, the fact that uh, they exceed, their impacts exceed local and national borders, so it's hard to assign accountability. Um, and then also the fact that there's a lot of scientific uncertainty still um, about whether or, or how we can connect specific weather events and weather event types to climate change. Um, and so what we're trying to do and, and understand is, is offer a more complete account um, of the, the structural factors, the social and ecological conditions um, that inform how individuals, uh, the, the context that individuals draw on um, to make climate attributions, to, uh, to understand blame and responsibility and to assign it, uh, to understand uh, their own risk and their own agency within that, that environment. Um, and then ultimately, whether or not all of those factors, we can predict um, mitigation or adaptation behaviors um, as a result of how people understand and navigate those factors uh, related to extreme weather events. Thank you. At this time, maybe our panelists can all uh, come up across there and we'll kind of facilitate uh, a discussion. Yeah, Tyler can be mostly here. We have some microphones so the panelists can speak. Bob will be online. Um, yeah, that'll be good. We'll do it that way. Um, so I thought um, I would kick off uh, the discussion with a question I was thinking about during this and um, the, the kind of theory that um, Erin was drawing on, that we've been drawing on for our work, um, comes out of uh, Ulrich Beck's Risk Society. And he talks about um, kind of organized irresponsibility and the idea of all this blame getting shifted systematically to enable people to continue acting the way they want to act, um, even though they're kind of creating risks. But also he talks about um, how uh, the governance systems that we have to deal with risk um, are kind of set up to quantify risk um, and manage them. And mainly he's thinking about things like insurance systems and, and things that that's how we deal with modern day risk is, you know, through insurance and things like this. And, um, but his argument is that we just go ahead and we put probabilities and numbers to those things to, to manage them, but really they're unknowable. And also those damages um, kind of can't be insured because when you ruin an ecosystem, no amount of money can buy back that ecosystem, right? So this, this kind of system. And so I guess the question I have for my, my, um, 
speakers and commentators is, I mean, Bob mentioned that kind of deep uncertainty in sea level rise and, and certainly in the solar geoengineering. And to what extent do you think we can quantify um, risk and it should be managed through that quantification process? And to what extent do you think there are unknowables and how do you think we deal with those? And so I'll kind of leave it there. And I don't know who wants to speak. I see Alan says he'll speak first to that. No, we'll let Bob after. Go ahead, Alan. So uh, there's a lot that I don't know. So but uh, there's a lot, a lot of unknowables. First of all, I'd like to say I'm really encouraged by Bob getting rid of his COVID haircut. COVID hair, so, uh, uh, that's a sign of, uh, of positivity about the future that we're getting back to normal. Uh, but I'm also discouraged. I saw an article in The Guardian recently that said fossil fuel companies make $3 billion a day selling fossil fuel. And they have for the last 50 years at current uh, levels. So that's a trillion dollars a year that they earn by selling fossil fuels, which are causing global warming. And the subtitle of the article said that's enough to pay every politician in the world to let them keep doing what they're doing. And so that's a really hard thing to push back against. And so I'm kind of discouraged that, and they have lobbyists and, and we're a bunch of professors, what, what power do we have? So, so as people see the impacts of climate change, or at least attribute things like floods and droughts to climate change, even if they aren't really caused by it, even if they're part of natural variability, that might get people to change their actions. But uh, I, I, doing solar geoengineering on top of that with all of its risks, I think is something that really has to be considered the potential benefits and risks in the future. And we need a lot more work on that. So I think some, and some of these risks are unknowable and we're not, not quite sure what to do with them. And so do we trust, I mean, if, if you drove here today, I'm sure you wore your seatbelt. God forbid you have an accident, you, it'll protect you, that in your airbag, but that won't destroy the whole planet. Would you trust the whole planet to a very complicated technical system that could fail? I mean, and it's not hard to think of much more complicated things in your car, like the Fukushima reactor or or uh, Boeing 737 MAX that fail because people are greedy or, or, or careless or don't know what they're doing. So the prospects of ever doing solar geoengineering, I think, are pretty low in the future. And, and it, it might not be a slippery slope to deployment if we do research. It might be a sticky slope. In other words, if we find risks that we can't solve, maybe we need to know that sooner rather than later. So you okay. think some research can characterize the risks more. I see Bob with his hand up and then I'll go to Tyler. Yeah, um, so I wanna, I guess, provide some theoretical framing for the specifics that, that Alan was talking about. It's got, I mentioned the concept of deep uncertainty. Um, deep uncertainty in the definition used by the IPCC um, has framed by Rob Lumpert about 20 years ago, where it had three elements. Uh, one, Basically, experts can't agree on key parameters that describe a system. Two, experts can't agree on uh, the key processes that are within a system. And or three different stakeholders have uh, non-aligned values uh, that affect or basically what um, you do. And so there's this whole field that's, that's grown up over the last couple of decades of decision making under deep uncertainty. Um, and some of those principles uh, that I sort of alluded to when talking about how, how we think about the sort of adaptation problem at a ground level are, are um, sort of generally applicable. Um, so, so one, to get specifically at Rachel's question, um, I think there is a continuum between, you know, we can uh, put probabilities on things and the probabilities are, are unquantifiable. Um, there's a concept that I've, I've, done some work on and uh, work, work with that, that dates back to Daniel Ellsberg and uh, working before he, he did the Pentagon papers at RAND um, uh, known as ambiguity, right? And, and so ambiguity sort of provides a metric of 
how well, essentially how well people can agree on probabilities of outcomes, sometimes called second order probability. Um, and I think in some cases, uh, certainly sea level rise projections being one, I think this is a case where we can do sort of second order probabilities on some of the processes that we can't agree on first order processes first. So this is reflected in the, the way the most recent ICCC report talks about uh, sea level rise as it has, okay, these are the processes in which there's at least a medium degree of agreement and the probability of outcomes rising from those. And then under different emission scenarios, here are some processes that we can't agree, but the range of of outcomes we thought sort of plausible and sort of in a, in a quasi probabilistic fact. I think that's quite useful, but what you have to do with those is then think about, okay, some of that learning that that Tyler was talking about, well, we can, can we uh, start to map that out in advance? How do we make sure we don't make decisions today that rule out important, like put us in a bad situation under uh, important contingencies? So how do we make sure, um, sometimes people talk about things like minimizing regret so we don't lock ourselves into a pathway, uh, you know, by say, ignoring the, the high end outcomes by say, ignoring the possibility that conflict over solar geoengineering could trigger global nuclear war. Uh, you know, my expert is my 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 uh, my unexpert assessment of which has probably increased over the last nine months relative to what it would have been a year ago. Um, but how do we how do we make sure that think about contingencies in advance, even if we can't uh, all agree, you know, agree on the probabilities? And how do we think about the values associated with different outcomes when when you know can we can we find pathways that are Pareto efficient? or approximating that so nobody is left worst off or we or we manage to minimize the amount of people left worse off by adopting a certain path. So that's, um, you know, I think there is a continuum between knowable probabilities and unknowable probabilities that's reflected by ambiguity. Um, there is a literature that's developed uh, to thinking about how we navigate this space. And I think it's a very important one for a lot of, a lot of climate issues. Uh, certainly solar solar geoengineering, um, and also when we think about, say, sea level adaptation on, on timescales beyond a few decades. Okay, thank you, Bob. And so, uh, Tyler, now you've got some meat. Yeah, um, thank you, Rachel, for the question. It's very interesting. And, and I'd, I'd echo and, and agree with what Bob said earlier, um, that the real world mess messiness is much more interesting and realistic, of course. Um, and I, I've been moving away from models almost exclu uh, exclusively. But um, the models, the model, the idealized model shows where, where the reference point is. And then you can, uh, as, w w as I discussed, we can, we can move from that and talk about all the ways that the real world is much more messy and chaotic than, the, than a model. Um, and I agree with what um, Alan, you said um, some risks can't be tested. I, yeah, many of them, the social risks, I'd say maybe all of them can't be tested. Even this question of um, moral hazard, there have been efforts to survey people on, you know, if you hear about solar geoengineering, what, what would be your reaction on, on your mitigation incentives? And, um, you know, they come up with some results, the, the results that you mentioned earlier, that they're actually scared about solar geoengineering to the extent that they are more incentivized to, mit to, to mitigate more in response. But that's only as particular people. We don't know what what government policy would 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 happen. Personally, I'm not as as worried about that. I am I am remain very, very worried about ungoverned solar geoengineering and its and its um, risk for for conflict. And it's I don't know how you put probabilities on that. So this project that we're doing with with RFF, we're gathering we're doing a I guess you could call it an expert elicitation with some role playing. We're gathering about eight or nine international security experts, some of whom have never really engaged with the topic of solar geoengineering, who are more familiar with, you know, what are the risks of China invading Taiwan, or what are the, what were the risks that Russia would invade Ukraine? Um, what, how, you know, we present, we'll present this, this idea of solar geoengineering. How do you see that affecting international politics? What are the key risks? Um, and we're going to present it in terms of scenarios as one, one idea to, to um, elicit these, these um, probabilities or likelihoods. We're, we're aiming for a ranking of risks. What are, the, what are the most important future scenarios where solar geoengineering might cause conflict? So one of them might be that a great power starts to do it on their own without any international agreement, US, China, or Russia, um, and the other great powers are opposed. Uh, a, a different scenario is, is a regional power, say Pakistan or India or, or Indonesia starts to do it on their own to protect uh, to try to protect their locality. Um, what happens when, when the region is opposed to that? We see that, that Australia is starting to investigate marine cloud brightening, and um, I'm not sure what, the, what effects that might have on the region. 
And then a third scenario might be some sort of weak international treaty or framework convention on, on geoengineering that starts to break down and you might have competing geoengineering efforts which would result in either conflict or overcooling. So I think we can all agree that, that ungoverned uh, geoengineering or geoengineering that's done, that's deployed without any sort of agreed rules would be, would be really risky. Great, thanks. Um, I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience. And so I think, uh, David, if you want to ask a Great, question. Rachel, could, I, could I just ask you to please repeat your um, repeat the question? So. I was going to say, I'll repeat the question when David says it. Yep. A policy conceived in a vacuum, which sounded logical, but it got no traction among social movements. Social movements came up with the Green New Deal, which through a lot of paring down has become the IRA. So I, I don't, I'm wondering what, why, why start with a fantasy, which is never going to happen, uh, or could only happen through enormous violence, which might make climate change look like a better option, if you did suggest those possibilities, why not start with research on what some social movement somewhere might actually want, if anything, from geoengineering? Those are good points. I, I certainly not, uh, there, there is no social movement for geoengineering. Um, in fact, if there is any social movement, it, you know, environmental groups on the left are, um, tend to be opposed to it. However, there are environmental groups that are um, less on the left, more technologically um, oriented, who are open to research and see it as a serious option. One could imagine a social movement in the future that would be for geoengineering. Um, I don't know, that, that's not my, my area of study, but, but I could certainly envision that if, if damages continue to get worse and mitigation continues not to work. Um, the, the approach, um, it, it, it's just how I was trained from public policy, and you might think of it as, as maybe a, um, an applied policy approach where, say, the White House tr goes to, to Congress with their, their ideal gun control bill and realizes it's going to be watered down by half or, or two-thirds. But you want to start with, your, start with the, the idealized, the optimal, the utopian um, policy. Now, I, I'm not... It, I, I, I said in the, in, the, in the talk that DICE doesn't address the distributional effects and that this, it has this hypothetical benevolent global decision maker, which no one would want, but, but we, we could agree that we're trying to improve social outcomes across the globe. Um, I don't know, it's probably just a, different, a, a difference in approaches. Um, but as to your, the earlier question, I, I don't think... Um, well, I, I don't think it's so far-fetched to see in the future some sort of movement for, for solar geoengineering. Um, I don't see why, why it wouldn't, what couldn't arise. I was going to say, I see uh, Bob up there and then Alan. Sure. I, I want to sort of not get into the details of geoengineering because that's not the expertise I big, but think more about David's broader point, um, which I think is an important one. Um, you know, I think we can... The, the question, I, I think I alluded to this in, in my remarks, of the sort of 
pure, more most economically driven first, what more economists would call first best approach, like this focus on carbon pricing. Um, I, I think it's unfair to say that, you know, that is responsible for us not having had national climate policy in 2010. Um, but I do think it's, it's uh, plausible to say that uh, an overly narrow set of, of perspectives perhaps led the policy analysis community um, to be less useful in looking at alternatives, right? And there was, a, I think, a fixation on carbon pricing that came out because this is sort of the first best approach that comes out of these uh, you know, variety of econ models uh, that led some of the green groups that had taken it up to toss out uh, more IRA looking alternatives uh, like the um, Bigaman Energy Bill that might have had a chance in the 20, 2009 to 2010 Congress, but didn't by the time they were the green groups were willing to look at them in 2011 to 2012. Um, so I think the the lesson I take away from this is is the those of us who are economically inclined uh, need to come at it with a little more humility uh, because there are alternative approaches, in this case, perhaps a political science approach uh, that might have that might have led the econ, econ community to say, okay, well, maybe we need to focus a little more on distributional consequences. Maybe we need to focus a little more on employment. Maybe we need to think a little bit more about learning and how investments uh, in R, D, and D uh, can, can reshape uh, a, a mechanism, which is really designed to the assumptions that you have a fixed basket of, of, uh, of low energy carbon technologies and a fixed basket of high carbon technologies. Um, and I think that the econ community has started in policy analysis have looked at this more seriously in the last decade plus, which helped lay the ground for uh, this. I mean, I want to say, you know, we would not have national climate policy had it not been for the social movements that David, uh, national climate legislation had not been for the social movements David talked about. Um, but I think we also would not have had it had we had the analysis community not had the tools uh, to say convince uh, the climate hawks in the Senate that the watered down version that that Senator Manchin proposed was going to get us a lot of the way to to our national goals. So I think the na analysis played an important role there as well. And in terms of the broader goals of this workshop, I think you know we have this broad interdisciplinary strength in environmental, social science, and governance and human ecology. We also have some good economic policy and anal analyst types, and, and we're growing that in places like Blaustein. Um, and I think the ability to take a more heterogeneous set of approaches to this common set of questions has the potential to be a great strength here at Rutgers compared to some other institutions. Great, thanks, Bob, and um, yep, Alan, and then Aaron. I'd, I'd like to uh, bring up two things. We're talking about governance of implementation of solar geoengineering, but before we get there, there's also been a lot of discussion about governance of research on geoengineering. Should it should we even do research on it? And some people are opposed to that. Some people submit proposals, and I'm completely against it. It's a terrible proposal. You shouldn't even do research. But I think it's important to separate indoor and outdoor research. Indoor research, which is what I do, is climate modeling, looking at impacts of volcanic eruptions. But people have proposed going outdoors and spraying something into the atmosphere, into the clouds, and seeing what happens. And that sometimes comes under local environmental regulations, but if you go too far away or out in the ocean, there are no regulations. And so that really needs a lot of work. How much are you allowed to do, to do and who independently is going to monitor it or sanction you if you break the rules? So there's a lot of work needs to be done on that. And getting back to David's question about what farmer would want less sunlight? Well. What if you tell the farmer, if you have a little bit less sunlight, you're going to get more diffuse radiation, so your crops are going to be fine, and you're going to have fewer droughts and fewer floods? Now, the question is, is that true? And uh, is that true in this farm? And, and you have to deal, so you have to do a lot of climate modeling and a lot of uh, uh, statistics to see how the, the envelope of the weather variability is going to change. But in any year, you can still have a drought and a flood. And how can you prove to the farmer that, yeah, well, we're, it is going to be better on a 20-year average, maybe not this year. So those are really difficult problems to, to deal with policy and governance. Thanks. And Aaron? I'll just uh, say real quickly, uh, the distinction between um, what's probable and what's 
what's possible. Um, and you know, there's some work that Chip Clark in the sociology department um, has done in the past about fantasy documents and also aware of some, some social movement research about how uh, future projections or models of the future uh, can guide action in the present. Um, and so when, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, idealized models of the future or, or end goals. Um, I do think that, that, that those uh, have some value in, in, in helping us think about what is at least possible. And, and you know, that's a, a difficult um, distinction to make with limited resources, as, as Tyler has talked about. Um, but I, I do think that um, for, you know, and, and who knows with a, a possible future uh, social movements for geoengineering, uh, whether that would be the case or not. Um, but I do think that that's a, an important consideration uh, when we think about social movements and uh, the utility of, of uh, you know, idealized or, or fantasy uh, sort of models of, of the future. Thanks. And I'll jump in here, kind of two points to think about. One is to David's um, question about the geoengineering um, stuff, not really social movement research, but I have been working with a team of researchers um, over in the Netherlands at, at Groningen University that um, we managed to do a survey of kind of public acceptability of SRM, um, trying to ask about it, trying to ask about different governance questions and, you know, concerns. Uh, and it, and managed to get about 20 countries, so samples from uh, 20 countries of um, either public or, or student samples of variations. And so that data is all under analysis now, which doesn't give you that good, there definitely needs to be more qualitative kind of research on the kind of the kind of movement base and, and different um, areas of opposition or support or preferences but um, does start to give us an idea of how people begin to even make sense of some of these proposals. Um, and the, the second thing I was thinking about was a paper that I had published with a bunch of folks a, wh a while back just looking at different geoengineering strategies. And one of the measures we had was um, what we call the ease of governance and kind of as we were assessing different things and SRM showed up as kind of the some of the ease of governance i mean we've talked about it as a challenge but was the idea that right now we're struggling to get everybody to implement you know mitigation strategies and everybody has to do it for it to kind of work right or at least big leaders and um versus srm was like well all you need is a small group of decision makers right and it's a it's a double-edged sword of being positive and my um negative and i also that i've been working with a group of um folks that are sociologists and public policy people who are really trying to develop some understandings. And I don't know, David, I don't think you'd like this stuff, but um, on kind of thinking about political feasibility. So it's almost more of a counter to the idea that, you know, what happens is kind of based on techno engineering analysis, certain mitigation um, solutions always get put forth um, and these guys are arguing that like, well, if we had better measures or better understandings of what's politically feasible as kind of or political or publicly acceptable or these kinds of things that um, that aren't just on the measures of kind of technical, um, you know, carbon reduced or um, the cost of it, which are the kind of two major measures that emerge. Um, but more about the public acceptability or political feasibility that we could be selecting things to focus on better and that this should be integrated into the selection of what mitigation um, opportunities we're targeting. So um, that's just a little bit to that point. Um, there, just for the folks online, we are monitoring the chat. If you're interested in, in entering a question, Matt will let me know. and. If, I, if you type a question into the chat, are there any students, I know we have some grad students in the audience, do you, any grad students have some questions? Um, anybody? Okay, then I'll open it. Any professors have some questions? <laughs> And Danielle, if you 
you can introduce yourself since you're yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Danielle Thousand. I'm a new assistant professor in the sociology department. Um, and thank you all for your presentations. Um, so I, my question is mainly for Tyler, but if others want to weigh in, I'm, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, so a lot of what you were presenting um, in terms of the valuation of risk was very much uh, economic risk, the DICE model, for example, um, and the others you brought up. So. I'm wondering what, what are the risks of using a mainly economic valuation of all of these different factors? And then are there opportunities in policymaking to bring in non-economic valuation of risk and other forms of um, like considering what, what is lost and what, uh, yeah, what are the risks of these different factors? Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, the the risk is you, you you just get it plain wrong. I mean the dice. So as I think I mentioned, dice and, and fund and page are the three integrated assessment models that were historically used to to uh, to come up with estimates for the social cost of carbon, which is used in regulatory assess uh, regulatory decisions across the U.S. federal government. And now there's new new work that just came out last week that's showing that those original estimates on the social cost of carbon were three and a half times um, too low. Um, now, was that because the original models were wrong or, or that we learned new information in the meantime? And I'm not sure Bob would be able to answer that question for us. Like, um, uh, I, like, as, like I, I think I mentioned, I, I've been personally interested in moving away from the modeling um, and, and looking at, at the, the hard to characterize risks like the international risks and the, and the, the other, the governance risks of, of, of solar geoengineering. I, I think models are still useful in, in, in teaching directions of processes and trade-offs. Um, DICE is, is used, was used so often because it was so accessible um, and it's very easy to, to manipulate to, to see, well, if I want to focus on this in the climate economy model, I could look at that. If I want to look at you know, learning or, or technological progress or if I want to add carbon dioxide removal, et cetera. And, and of course, now people have added um, I didn't mention there have been several papers now that have added geoengineering into that mix. Look, what's the opt, you know, from a DICE perspective, what's the optimum mix of mitigation adaptation of geoengineering? And it comes out with, you know, lines. Um, I, I guess I, my, I don't trust the, the axes as much, but I, I can trust the movement in the lines when you tweak the model. Just getting the, the, the models are helpful, and to me at least, in understanding the relative movements when you when you tweak something as opposed to the actual details now much more serious economists looking at working on the source of cost of carbon have come up with these new estimates and so um i guess i'd refer part of your question on to bob can i just clarify my question really quickly i just i wasn't about the modeling specifically it was about the economic cost as the measure so like the idea of cheapness or the idea of which option is best based on economic cost? Is there an opportunity to bring in non-economic valuation that goes beyond that into, into policy making considerations? Not necessarily into modeling. I mean, that can be broadened, but that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, the most straightforward approach is to c convert people's preferences into, uh, if you want to put a number on it, I, you can, money is, is the, the way you put numbers on it. But yes, people are often not clear about how much they might. It, it's hard to translate when you ask somebody, obviously. So you would be much more familiar with, with those other valuation methods. I think but, Bob has yeah. maybe Bob, has some Bob thoughts has on some thoughts. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, a couple of thoughts. I mean, at a fundamental level, the way that if you want to be salient to decision making, you have to ask what are the what are the decision frameworks that are being used by uh, the relevant people making decisions, um, and I think that you know you can tackle that from a different couple of different perspectives. Benefit cost analysis is really well embedded at this point in U.S. national decision making processes. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, there are also limitations of that. And I mean, when you, when you use the word non-economic valuation, has somebody who, who walked in the space, I actually don't know what that means. It seems like once you're valuing, once you're valuing things and you know, like that is in some way putting it within the realm of economics and the question is, well, how do you do 
um, you know, how, how do you do these trade-offs, right? Economics is the study of the trade-offs. Can you articulate these trade-offs in a way that is useful within the frameworks that the decision-making decision makers are using? Um, and so for regulatory impact analysis in the US, either they, if you want something to actually be valued, you need to get it into, you need to monet, do monetary valuation that, that can be traded off. But as I think the Inflation Reduction Act shows, right, that's not the only input point into the policy process. And uh, you know, better benefit cost analysis um, uh, is, you know, was not what was not what got the Inflation Reduction Act passed away. It was better political economy, different sorts of values in, in play there. Um, so, and, and when you do decision analysis more broadly, sometimes you, you quantify things and sometimes you don't. So I think part of my general message is that these boundaries are too sharply drawn. Uh, economists perhaps, uh, as, I, as I think I said, need a little more humility and recognize where you know, sort of the economic style of thinking has, you know, can usefully input into the decision process and where broader sets of values are strengths. Um, but if you take, you know, sort of broad sense, if you're looking at trade-offs, you, you, you can factor those into economic models. You just have to think carefully about how you do that. And the danger where people are, 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 are where economic thinking dominates and not trying to um, go into the play in that space is that if something doesn't actually fit onto the thing that people are inclined to use as their primary metric, even though it's discussed in the text, it may be valued at zero. Um, so, so I think you, you, the, the key message I would say is, well, you want some, your, you know, alternative valuations to go in, you have to think about how they fit into the decision frameworks people are using. Alan, you had a thought? Yeah. I had the same question. Uh, a lot of people use dice and they said, I said, what about this risk? Well, we don't know how to quantify that. So we're just going to set it to zero for now and ignore it. And that's sort of the typical practice of economists, in my, it seems. And so there's a lot of things that are really hard to quantify. And they say, well, we can't quantify it, so we're just going to ignore it. Uh, but then what do you do? How, how, how does that even, if you're going to ignore it and make decisions without even knowing what these uh, risks are, how do you then do governance? That's the, I don't understand how to how to how to solve that problem. Well, 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 one approach would be scenario analysis, right? So if you can't put a probability on it, you can try to say, okay, well, how would this affect, you know, this economic analysis if this thing we can't quantify were to be the case? And an IPCC terminology that's become known as storyline approaches. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think, but I think it's a, I think it's a, a very legitimate critique that the traditional economic models like dice. Uh, tend to ignore things or do extremely poor job of valuing things that are hard to value. Yeah, and to um, to Danielle's question, I think too, uh, you know, imagining um, governance futures for the Anthropocene, right? And, and Bob's answer of like, well, so much of our decision making is guided by cost benefit analysis, um, kind of highlights like what other kinds of decision making processes could we have out there that aren't cost benefit analysis that might capture more and kind of imagining what would governance look like not ruled you know either either having complementary things to cost benefit analysis or just totally different kinds of decision making processes Oh, and, um, and I think, well, and I just wanted to highlight to, I think, both David and Danielle's question, we will be getting to more of this, these issues um, in our last session because we're talking about um, stakeholder participation and, and managing competing interests as well. And so, um, and kind of how to engage uh, diverse stakeholders in, in governance and in, in those decision making processes. So it, we will get to it. I see Bob again. <laughs> yeah, just just one one more point, which is I think when we talk about benefit cost analysis, another dose of humility. I think um, we have to ask the question: How often is the benefit cost analysis actually driving the decision, and how is it often is it being used post hoc? Uh, to justify or rationalize a decision that is actually driven by the by other political economy factors, not reflected uh, in the formal analysis. And, um, and there is a, you, was a willingness to overthrow cost benefit analysis results when they're not the answer they want. It's you know done and, in and, a couple and, of and, my, and, and um, Stuart Shapiro has done some work on this. Uh, 
and I, I think exactly how Frank, but I think you, you, you can try and brought, I think, some evidence that benefit cost analysis matters on the margins. Uh, but, um, you know, I would not expect benefit cost analysis to be driving something like large scale legislation. Uh, it, it, you know, it may, it, 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 I think it probably does matter for your small electric motors energy efficiency rule. And, and how, how much, how much is a blue sky worth? If you're going to do this and create a cloud in the stratosphere permanently and, and have milky looking skies, how much is that risk costing you? How do, or the ability to see the Milky Way, how much are you going to evaluate those? Uh, you mentioned on the other side, beautiful sun, how much is that a benefit? So uh, I don't know how to solve these problems. Well, but yeah, I'm not speaking for economists, but I, I'm public policy, but which is part of part economists, but, but they would, they would respond, well, you can do a, a revealed preference study, you know, a willingness to pay or a willingness to accept survey that can convert into monetized values of, you know, how much would I be willing to, to pay to keep, to keep the blue sky or willingness to accept a, a, a different sky. Um, I, just one quick point, though. The policy process, something could pass the cost-benefit analysis test and not the political test. So the, there's the political test as well, and there's the, the feasibility uh, you know, political test for your party, and then there's the feasibility of actually getting something done. So it's CBA is, is part of the whole policy sausage making machine, but it's I think it's still useful. Uh, one comment from online from Deborah Greenwood, and she says that we can also combine life cycle analysis with cost benefit analysis to identify trade offs and externalities. Right, and I I know in uh, Tyler's CBA some decision analysis and I teach decision analysis in my energy and society class in the sense that it can explicit, explicitly set up different objectives and, and kind of measure them not always in dollars but on scale you're still doing number things to it but scales and also tries to take into account uncertainty I mean, I, you, you could have a politically determined objective that you do cost effectiveness analysis so you've decided the objective regardless of any other analysis you know we want to do this What's the cheapest way to do that? OK, well, thank you so much. That ends our first session promptly at 1030. Um, and we're very happy to uh, have you all get a chance to talk to each other now and um, help yourself to coffee and snacks that are about. Hi, uh, I'm Karen O'Neill from the Department of Human Ecology at Rutgers. And uh, we're really so glad to have you here. Uh, this morning, we talked about environmental um, governance and uncertainty. And now we're moving on to discussing uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the, and I guess returning to the idea of organizations, how is the world organized for making decisions and how are the environmental problems organized? Um, uh, I would invite you to open your mind to a whole array of things other than the nation state as well. So we use the term governance in this conference to cover things such as um, that Tyler mentioned, uh, the possibility of private actors, and I believe, it, and Alan also, private actors uh, undertaking geoengineering, that could become a form of governance itself. Certainly we talk about corporate governance, we talk about um, non-governmental organizations in many countries taking uh, on governmental duties. Uh, and, and then working into the realm of culture and, uh, you know, things that are not, talk about hard to quantify. So um, we are going to start this out with a speech from Rat Kim, and he's Assistant Professor of Global Environmental Governance uh, in the Copernicus Institute at Utrecht University. Uh, he also, uh, like Tyler, has, I think, some institutional lessons to give us about how you can organize the university to do this work. And his particular topic is on how we design institutions that can effectively coordinate across complex institutional and geographic boundaries, um, including what effective coordination might look like. Um, and that's actually an excellent question, right? Like, how do we know when it's good? So Rack is assistant professor at uh, the Global, uh, the Copernicus Institute at Utrecht. Um, he is doing a five-year research program now on problem shifting, and I hope you will discuss a little bit about that, yeah, uh, between international in, uh, treaty regimes. And so this gets at certainly some of the issues we were talking about before, who's responsible for what. 
Um, he's an interdisciplinary social scientist, uh, and he works in environmental governance and international environmental law, uh, and many, many different topics. Uh, and a couple of things to note is that he's worked uh, with the United Nations as a lead author on the UN uh, Environmental Program's Global Environmental Outlook, and uh, on uh, he's doing a number of other, uh, co-authoring the Science and Implementation Plan of the Earth System Governance Project. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand where our speakers are coming from in that regard, and I do think you're going to certainly be able to tell us a little bit about Europe as opposed to the United States as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karen, um, <clears throat> for having me here, and also for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor, really. Uh, I think it's the first time I speak at an American university. Um, so it's a bit, uh, I don't know, what, I don't know what to expect and I, I, in terms of, <laughs> but I, so far I've experienced a very uh, warm hospitality. I thank you very much for that. Um, so, yeah, um, let me start by asking you all a question. Um, how many multilateral environmental agreements do you think there are in the world? Um, any guesses? I think uh, Michelle might know the answer, but <laughs> yes, um, five? five, 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 only five. No, I mean you have to multiply that by many, many. <laughs> um, so by multilateral environmental agreements, I mean you know things like Paris uh, Agreement, CBD, CITES. Uh, um, any guesses? Sorry, hundred. Okay, actually there are more than a thousand um, international environmental agreements. If you also count those that are agreed by just two states, which are referred to as bilateral environmental agreements, you have more than 2,000 actually. Um, so, so, and the, these were all developed to address different environmental issues, ranging from saving um, beds and albatrosses to, of course, addressing climate change. Uh, and these treaties also consist of different member states. Um, so these institutions conflict uh, and contradict some and collide more often than we tend to think. And there are so many of them because 200 sovereign states had to be brought together to cooperate to address transboundary environmental agreement, uh, sorry, problems um, that cross geographical boundaries. But now the situation is that the, the, the myriad international institutions themselves are in need um, of co coordination beyond institutional boundaries. So um, that is the issue of institutional coordination is, the, is going to be the main topic of my talk today. Um, not sure to what extent you are familiar with this planetary boundaries framework, but as you all know, um, we are faced with many environmental challenges. Among them are nine arguably <clears throat> most critical issues identified in this so-called planetary boundaries framework. Among these issues are uh, climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, land use change, and so on. Uh, and these boundaries collectively define uh, what is referred to as a safe operating space for humanity. But we have already stepped beyond some of these boundaries. In other words, humans have pushed the Earth system towards the edge of the Holocene basin of attraction. Uh, if the business as usual um, sort of trends continue, the Earth system will soon cross uh, tipping points um, and begin a forceful nonlinear transition into a hostile state. So what we must do as a species, I mean, if we want to avoid an unsafe future, is to break away from the current trajectory and lead the Earth system uh, into an alternative state, which is, a, which is more safe and just. And in that regard, planetary stewardship or steering uh, is necessary, I'd say. Uh, the course of the Earth system basically needs to be changed. So, and for that, governance at the Earth system scale is needed. Um, some call it Earth, uh, call this new paradigm of governance uh, in the Anthropocene, Earth system governance. Um, it aims to prevent, mitigate, and adapt to, adapt to Earth system transformations by regulating human impact at all levels, um, not just at the global level, but at all levels, including local level, national level, uh, and regional level, 
but from a planetary perspective. The, the hundreds or thousands of international environmental treaties that we have, uh, which I mentioned earlier, are, for example, part of this system over system governance. Uh, so, for effective Earth system governance, um, coordination between institutions is very important. Uh, if you look at this diagram, the, uh, the, these, these are, these are uh, various, on the left-hand side, uh, what is listed on the left-hand side are various global drivers that cause the Earth system to change. And these drivers uh, disturb these climate ecosystems and have an impact on our society, our economy and health. Etc. But the impact of these drivers does not stop at that, um, because un 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 unwanted outcomes such as climate change in turn act as drivers and amplify other problems. So the drivers and problems are all interconnected in a very complex manner. Uh, and you see, he uh, oops. yeah, you see here uh, in the diagram the people, uh, and I'll refer to them as uh, agents of Earth system governance, and these agents you tend to seek to address the drivers, the root causes listed on the left, by creating institutions uh, such as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Climate Treaty, for example, to give some examples at the, uh, at the international level. And if these two institutions are better coordinated, of course, they, their joint efforts will be more effective and efficient. And that's one of the reasons why we need in institutional coordination. And now, uh, let me bring your attention to the seizures in the, in the diagram. Um, what is this seizures, a pair of seizures doing in this diagram? Can you maybe share your thoughts? Um, yeah, decoupling, but what is it cutting? I mean, so, I mean, this is not what the authors say in the paper, but my, this is my interpretation, my take on this. But I think, the, I think we can interpret the seizures as a specific type of institutions that target symptoms rather than the root causes. Uh, and for example, if we, uh, it may include institutions that aim to protect certain species by setting up a protected area without really addressing the root cause uh, that drives species to extinction. Um, the issue is that such narrowly focused uh, institutions may often simply shift problems uh, rather than really addressing and solving the problems. What I, what, what, uh, what I observe is that as environmental problems uh, are becoming more and more wicked, complex and deeply entrenched, uh, we are becoming increasingly uh, reliant on uh, using these seizures. Uh, uh, as, uh, and there are so many of those in today's environmental governance. And, and, some, for, some, for, uh, and some form of coordination between those uh, seizures is really desperately needed, I'll say, and perhaps some of them should be also removed. Uh, and such uh, uh, bug passing uh, uh, between environmental institutions, so shifting of problems rather than really solving them, uh, may happen on a planetary scale between the planetary boundaries I mentioned before. Um, the green links on, you see on the, on the diagram are biophysically mediated interactions between planetary boundaries, and blue links are human mediated interactions. Um, as you can see, uh, human activities have left a big impact on how you know, different earth systems, subsystems, uh, and, and processes interact with one another. Uh, and due to the highly interdependent nature of, of these subsystems and processes, environmental solutions that aim to respect one planetary boundary may negatively affect others as well. And here's a more specific example. Uh, this diagram on the right shows the various effects of, uh, of tree planting. Uh, on, on, on the nine planetary boundaries. And generally speaking, if you plant a lot of trees, you are basically making a, uh, generally making a positive contribution to climate change uh, and land system change. And, 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 but you may be creating actually additional stress on uh, sorry, biosphere integrity, biogeochemical flows, and fresh water use. So even tree planting policy, uh, which is you know, widely considered as benign, green, and, and, and good, uh, needs to be carefully coordinated with other environmental policies and institutions. So the question, um, which uh, Karen kindly referred to as a very good question, actually is not a question that I um, um, came up with. It was actually given by <laughs> the organizers to, <laughs> to speak to. Uh, which, but I kept them because I really love them. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so here's the question. So how do we design institutions that can effectively coordinate across complex institutional and geographical boundaries? And what does um, effective coordination look like? Um, I'm afraid I don't have all the answers to these questions, but let me just share some of my thoughts. Um, and, and hopefully we can have a nice discussion afterwards. <clears throat> Uh, but let me also highlight that, I mean, of course, my, my research is, is, is not about uh, coordination at all levels. Um, I, uh, although coordination is important not only at the international level among treaties and international organizations, it's really crucial at all levels of governance. But um, my, in my research, I study uh, in particular environment, international environmental institutions, um, especially multilateral environmental agreements. Um, what you see in this photo is, of course, you probably all recognize is the UNFCCC COP, uh, and there are tens of COPs uh, out there in operation. And if you count also the various treaty bodies, uh, then the number goes up to a few hundred. Um, what I'm inter particularly interested in is to understand the structural properties of the larger system uh, that these institutions um, give rise to and how the emergent structures um, impact institutional coordination and ultimately overall performance of the hundreds of, of, of uh, international environmental institutions that uh, we have. So now let me um, briefly introduce the overarching structure of global governance um, using a diagram that I drew, <laughs> uh, which um, is included in a book that I uh, uh, co-edited with um, Frank Biermann. Um, so in the environmental domain, we, for example, have <clears throat> major uh, treaties such as the CBD, CITES, UNCCD, etc. And these treaties interact with one another for, for various reasons uh, and form what's referred to as regime complexes in international relations literature um, or what some refer to as macro scopic architectures. Um, and and an, exa an example I'm sharing here is the network of 747 multilateral environment agreements, which I mapped as part of my PhD, actually, many years ago, um, using citations as proxies for inter-treaty interaction. And such large structures also in turn interact with another larger, large structure. Um, and this is another network I met with a colleague in uh, John Frederick Morin, uh, and it shows even larger structure that forms, had, that has formed through, through bottom-up interactions between the network of environmental agreements on the one hand, which is the green, oh, sorry, green, uh, green notes, uh, and the network of trade agreements on the other hand, which are the, which are represented as, uh, as blue dots. Um, sorry. At, at the largest level, there is a, there's one large web of institutions, and, and this is, as you can see, very complex. And um, there's not been a, a comprehensive mapping done so far, um, but this network here is probably a good indication of what that system might look like. It is a network of approximately 300 international organizations, shown by uh, 1.5 million hyperlinks. So this is uh, a re recent project that I, I, I worked with um, uh, uh, with one of my PhD students. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is, this is the picture of global governance. Uh, and these emergent structures uh, are very interesting, at least in my view. I find it fascinating to study these structures by focusing on certain structural properties as key variables. Uh, for example, scholars have um, sought to understand to what extent and, and why an institutional network is structurally fragmented, uh, polycentric or, or complex, and, and what it means to its functioning, basically. So um, why is this relevant and important? Because through such a research endeavor, I think we may be able to better understand which structures are more effective in achieving coordination. Uh, and, and also, we may be able to find out which governance interventions are needed to improve overall effectiveness. Um, th there are various structural properties one can highlight, um, but overall, the mainstream view is that governance is 
fragmented. Um, not a surprise. Uh, in other words, institutions are disconnected and conflicting more often than not, and therefore coordination challenges uh, arise. Um, but we do, I think, what is less at, uh, acknowledged, uh, and I think we, what we need to more carefully acknowledge is that fragmentation does not necessarily imply anarchy or disorder. Uh, and we, when we look into the structure of various institutional uh, networks, we can actually observe some sort of emergent order, uh, and it arises through self-organization. So let me, if, if, if I may use the, the example that I shared earlier, the network of international environmental agreements, um, the current structure you see on the bottom right uh, is, uh, uh, has emerged through in individual treaties, um, citing and interacting with a few chosen others. Um, but with, with whom they interact with is not determined by some sort of a central coordinator or, or uh, architect, but by the individual institutions themselves. And yet, with, when we pay close attention to the structural pattern that these institutions and their interactions give rise to and create, a certain regularities can be observed at the network level. Um, so that basically the structure is not completely random. Um, it is, to some extent, um, hierarchical, actually. You can observe hierarchical structure within this network. So then, um, what is wrong with the emergent order we observe? What is hindering effective coordination uh, between international environmental uh, institutions? I think there probably, I mean, obviously there are many reasons for this, but let me highlight uh, two. Um, <clears throat> first, I think because coordination at the moment uh, occurs mainly through self-organization. I mean, the system is too decentralized. So far, coordination between international institutions has occurred in an ad hoc fashion. Um, so uh, in the absence of a clear collective goal, um, and also there is no strong obligation to coordinate with others beyond sharing information, for example, uh, which, is in, which is insufficient when considering that these international institutions are in effect actually competing against each other for resources to survive uh, and become more successful. So then, then the question rises, uh, why is strong coordination difficult to impose on international institutions? Um, <clears throat> I think a key reason here is because international institutions are legally autonomous uh, entities, just like states. Um, and why? Because of the sovereignty of their member states. So there is an inherent limit to which any two international institutions may cooperate because there is no perfect overlap in membership. Um, to give an example, so for example, a key reason why it has been very difficult to effectively coordinate um, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Bi uh, Diversity, and the Climate uh, uh, Treaty is, the fact, is, is in fact that the US is, is not party to the CBD. Um, so whenever there is a need, to, need for inter-treaty sort of coordination, cooperation, the US has you know, put up their hand and, and, and refused by basically saying, for example, uh, discussing biodiversity matters at a climate conference is a violation of their state sovereignty. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, in addition to these two sort of reasons at the surface, um, I, could, uh, I could mention a few other more subtle factors that have acted against improving institutional coordination at the international level. Um, generally speaking, there is a strong presumption against normative conflict in international law. So that's to say, um, there's an assumption that norms such as human rights uh, uh, protection and environmental protection, for example, are synergistic rather than conflictive. Uh, and, and because of this assumption, there hasn't been much attention on develop, developing effective tools for addressing normative conflicts which are increasingly uh, um, surfacing. Such a, and such a presumption is particularly prominent when it comes to environmental institutions, in my view. Um, 
because one of the underlying assumptions is that all environmental institutions are green, um, you know, in, environment friendly, basically. And, and, and therefore, what we most focus on is implementation of these environmental institutions and rules and regulations. Um, and, and any side effects are kind of conveniently labeled as unintended and, and, and sometimes also inevitable, something that we just have to live with. Um, <clears throat> And, and therefore, coordination challenge is somewhat sort of sidelined, um, and, and and we have to we have tended to also assume that if we address environmental problems um, uh, one by one, uh, and even if we do so in isolation from sort of one another, the whole is going to be greater than the sum of the parts. I think that's kind of an underlying assumption that we all have, um, but this assumption has been increasingly challenged uh, thanks to kind of the thanks to the uh, to SDG research um, I think one of the I, I'm not happy with the, the many number of the SDGs and targets that we have <laughs> agreed to but as a, as a kind of byproduct um, it has allowed a, an, a, as an opportunity to realize that there are actually many trade-offs between um, um, well-intended norms and objectives uh, including those that are also environmental in nature, um, as you can see on this diagram. So the orange bits are trade-offs, green bits are synergies. Um, <clears throat> so, but, so at the moment, um, it is unclear whether the overall effect of, effect of the hundreds of environmental treaties and or, or the, the 17 SDGs and 169 targets we have, etc., is is positive or negative to, to the question a little bit uh, uh, to make a pro provocative kind of proposition, um, and I think now is time really to take this question about overall performance of institutions more seriously in governance research. So um, then, what should the institutions look like? for more effective coordination and how do we get there? These are more, more difficult questions. Um, uh, and, and, but many scholars made a number of different suggestions and, and I don't think we, we, we are in short of ideas, actually. Um, and, I, and I cannot go through them, uh, through all of them right now, um, but there is a recent paper which I want to talk about um, briefly that has organized these many suggestions under the label of complexity management. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, this label. Um, I, I don't think we can manage complexity, but just for the sake of um, uh, yeah, for convenience, maybe we can use it. Uh, I decided to use it in, in this presentation. And there are basically four options for managing institutional complexity for better coordination. Uh, and the first one is to manage institutional complexity through contextual design. Uh, and this is about designing new institutions with a view to creating synergistic relations, uh, relationships they should have with existing institutions. So when we design or uh, design a new treaty, let's think about what is, well, what is already existing. Um, this is important because depending on the nature of the connection new institutions may or may not create, uh, the institutions, new institutions may integrate or further fragment the existing governance um, architecture. Uh, and there are various tools that exist for building and defining relationships between um, new and old uh, institutions, including, for example, um, by including a saving clause or conflict clause in a new treaty. Uh, and, and there are also other uh, examples of similar tools. Um, but, and these tools are, yes, helpful, are useful, um, but they are generally ineffective and, and in, in, uh, insufficient. Um, and, and the most recent development in this regard uh, does not look promising either. One of the first things that the drafters of the new BBNJ treaty, the Treaty on Marine Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which is actually the negotiation of which is, under, uh, uh, is continuing, ongoing at the moment, is that this new treaty shall not undermine exist, existing institutions, frameworks, and bodies. 
So that was a key principle under which the negotiation kind of took, started off. Um, and it's still the case. I mean, uh, of course, there's room for interpretation. What exactly does it mean? I mean, not undermining is, is not, uh, as, uh, you know, not undermining the effectiveness of ex existing institutions or not undermining the autonomy of the existing institutions. Um, uh, that's up for interpretation, but the, but the mainstream view is the sort of, yeah, it should not undermine the, the autonomy uh, of ins existing institutions. So that then the chances are that this new BBNJ treaty is probably going to be yet another fragment uh, added to uh, what is already a fragmented system rather than serving as some sort of a centripetal force that brings fragments together. <clears throat> Thirdly, um, redesigning existing institutions may help. Um, that is to acknowledge uh, that there are already many institutions, probably more than enough. Uh, so rather than keep adding new ones whenever we face new issues, we should fix and repurpose existing institutions. In fact, many institutions are self-adapting uh, through formal and informal processes, but the primary motive, in my view at least, to change and adapt uh, might have been just to attract more resources and survive uh, as institutions. So kind of to, to, to jump on the uh, uh, climate bandwagon, for example, because climate change has become a, such a topical thing. Um, so it's not conclusive whether institution, institutional change we can observe are adaptation or maladaptation, so to speak. And repurposing an institution can be politically challenging as it has been the case with, uh, with the proposal to um, repurpose the UN Trusteeship Council, which has not yet been realized. And thirdly, uh, there are the suggestions to create interagency coordinating mechanisms that cut across institutions. Um, the proposal to, uh, the, to upgrade UNEP into an world environment organization would fall into this type of, it, this category of ideas. And also existing examples include um, the joint liaison group between the three Rio conventions and also the joint COP between the three conventions on hazardous waste. But not all such coordination mechanisms work well, um, which is not also not surprising. Um, and recently, uh, 40 plus international organizations are working together in various constellations to coordinate SDG indicators. But these coordination mechanisms um, are themselves called fragmented to varying degrees, um, so which is also hindering their effectiveness um, as serving as coordinators. Lastly, uh, institutionalized strategies of orchestration and meta-governance may enhance institutional coordination. And broadly understood, the SDGs themselves are an example because one of the expectations of the SDGs is that they would serve as orchestrators to, uh, and, and reduce fragmentation. fragmentation. Um, but in the research that my, one of my PhD students uh, led, the SDGs have failed to live up to the expectation. And in fact, we found that global governance structurally has become more fragmented after the adoption of the SDGs in 2015. And lastly, um, I, I would like to add some of my own ideas. Um, in, in my research, I've been arguing that a key missing puzzle in international environmental law and governance is, is an overarching goal. Um, or Grundnorm, um, the basic norm that resides of, above the objectives of all international environmental institutions. Um, we can have a debate about this, whether it exists, <laughs> what it might be, but, but in my view, it's, it's, it's unclear uh, if, it, if such an overarching purpose clearly exists or if it does what it might be. I don't think it does exist. Um, and I believe it is a key reason why the absence of uh, the, this clear overarching goal uh, um, of international environmental law is a key reason why the system of international environmental institutions remains functionally fragmented, while structurally it may not be so fragmented. So it's overly, uh, clearly functionally fragmented. Uh, and um, it probably it's not a matter of installing a new 
central organization such as a World Environment Organization, I don't think it's going to fix the problem. But uh, unless it is accompanied with a clear objective um, for the entire system. Determination of what this group norm might be would require, of course, um, extensive global debate and deliberation. But uh, in, in my view, if we go through the hundreds and thousands of international environmental institutions that we have already, a strong candidate uh, is, is protecting, maintaining, restoring global ecological integrity uh, because it is the common denominator we can find in, uh, in, across many institutions that we have. What we also need, uh, in my view, is more effective and advanced form of secondary norms uh, in international law and governance. So secondary norms are the norms that shape the relationships between primary norms of conduct. Uh, and they are critical for aligning fragmented pieces towards a group norm, which I just mentioned. Um, as, so this is a quote from uh, an article from Daniel Podensky, who argues in here, here in relation to international law, what makes international law a system is, 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 uh, is a, a, rather than a simply collection of rules is not its primary rules, but its secondary rules. It makes sense if you think about it. I mean, from such a perspective, I've begun to think that many of the answers to environmental problems um, might not be in international environmental law as such, but maybe it's in, it can be found in, or it can be uh, uh, um, yeah, found by advancing international institutional law instead, which is a collection of uh, secondary rules. Uh, we, I think we have enough primary rules for regulating human behavior, but we seem to like secondary norms or rules on how these behavioral uh, rules should relate to one another. Um, with that, I think how much time do, we, do I have? Maybe 10 minutes? Yes, I, I just, so, um, I'm running a five-year project with a research grant from, Europe, from the European Research Council. It started last year, and it's called Problem Shifting. And I, in this project, I focus on um, how problems actually might be shifting between international environmental agreements rather than them being resolved. Um, and uh, in this project, I'm particularly interested in understanding why it happens, the causes of it. Um, the, in particular, the politics of problem shifting, um, assure, not assuming, but um, challenging the assumption that not all problem shifts are unintended or unanticipated, um, that some of them are actually in, may be intended, and also the decision makers who let problem shifts to happen um, had some sort of knowledge about the consequences. So why, why did they allow this? Um, why did they allow bug passing? Why did they allow um, shifting of problems to, to elsewhere? Um, so that's the causal, uh, the, the question relating to causes of problem shifting. And I'm also interested in the effects of problem shifting. Um, that is to say, well, obviously, if you shift the problem to, to another institution, the institution that is receiving the problem is, is negatively impacted. Uh, which is, well, if we are able to quantify or understand to what extent it's negatively impacted, it's, it's interesting. But what I'm interested in more is to understand the systemic effects, or systemic risks that problem shifts create on the entire system of international environment agreements. So that's another um, side to the project. And with the Hopefully, by uh, in a few years, I will have some answers to these questions, and and based on which, I might be able to better um, uh, uh, might have, might be, might have a better idea on how we might be able to address this issue of problem shifting in the solutions part of the project. Um, I will soon be hiring. I, I have two PhDs working on this at the moment. Uh, I will soon be hiring a postdoc. If you know of someone who is. Who might be potentially interested, um, please let me know. I really would appreciate it because in my experience of hiring, I mean, finding a good person is can be really challenging. So please um, 
um, let me know if you have if you know of any good candidates and yeah so with that I'd like to end my presentation um, this is my if you want to if you if you care to know a little bit more about myself um, please go to this website and and also please follow me on Twitter and I'll follow you back thank you so much thank you very much So we've asked the uh, commentators to really bring their own research to this problem and I think uh, you're going to see a variety of different approaches to what they consider governance problems. But um, what's interesting uh, to us repeatedly in the social sciences is that the natural scientists bring with them all sorts of observations about the problems that they're experiencing. So um, first we're going to have Rick Lathrop come up and speak. Thank you, Rock, for that introduction. So um, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak about some of the work, but let me preface my remarks that I don't study international ecosystem governance per se, but the topic is central to the issue of concern um, that I'm involved in, which is shorebird conservation biology. So first off, what's a shorebird? If you go down to the Jersey Shore and you see little birds running in towards the waves and then back out towards the wave, that's a shorebird, okay? But what you might not realize is that shorebird, particular species that we're familiar with is the sanderling, um, actually bred in the Arctic and is probably just on passing through on its way further south. And, um, and so for the past 20 years, I've been part of an international uh, team of conservation biologists focused on a particular species of imperiled shorebird called the, the red knot. And like the sanderling um, and many other species of shorebirds, the knot breeds in the Arctic, okay, um, and then migrates down the, uh, through Canada, the eastern coast of the U.S. before um, heading towards Central America. And in some cases, the knot always goes all the way to the southern tip of South America. So this species spans the hemisphere, the southern um, and northern hemisphere, and um, stopping at many countries along the way. So Tierra de Fuego, Chile, Argentina, up through Brazil, Caribbean countries, then here in the US, multiple states before going up to the Canadian Arctic. Um, so whereas if you look outside here, um, We've got a section of woods, woods. The wildlife in that woods doesn't belong to Rutgers. Um, if you're a landowner, wildlife here in the United States doesn't belong to the landowner. It is a uh, public trust, okay? It's owned by all the people um, in, uh, you know, in the state. It's managed by the state as a, as a, uh, a public good. So here we've got a species, not just um, you know, the owner, you know, in terms of an individual country, but multiple countries. So in terms of um, conservation provide needs for these particular species, some kind of intergovernmental uh, cooperation, some inner um, governance. Now in terms of migratory shorebirds, these Arctic breeding shorebirds, they depend on key locations, key migratory stopovers um, as they move from their breeding grounds to their overwintering grounds. And so um, shorebirds require um, you know, in, in terms of thinking about particular locations, but how they're uh, connected, okay? So one of the uh, multilateral agreements um, uh, related to shorebird conservations is, uh, is the Ramsar. Um, and so that was listed on Rack's talk. So this, this is a, um, uh, the Ramsar Convention on uh, Wetlands is an intergovernmental treaty to provide the framework for now national action as well as international cooperation for the conservation and wise use of wetlands and their resources. But it's, it's looking at particular locations, particular sites. Another key multilateral uh, institutional uh, player is the Western Hemisphere um, Shorebird Reserve Network. And so what this sets, you know, WISHERN, that's the acronym, apart is it 
It's thinking more holistically in terms of trying to encompass um, a particular species entire life cycle. Okay, thinking about the entire flyway and network of reserves. Now, individual species may use some reserves and not other reserves. Um, but a species, but the idea is like the knot needs, you know, it's stopping at, at again at, at multiple places um, uh, through its uh, flyway. The first Western Reserve was actually here in New Jersey, at the Delaware Bay uh, Reserve back in 1986, and since now then has expanded to um, a number of um, several hundred um, sites. Um, and uh, so this non-governmental organization actually coordinated by the Manomet Bird Observatory, which is another gov non-governmental organization, seeks to build capacity in local organizations um, to allow them to deliver more um, effective conservation actions for each of these particular um, sites. One minute. Okay. And so um, uh, to, to, so to think about this in terms of um, to be successful in conserving bird, shorebirds more broadly, we've got to sustain coastal ecosystems across the particular uh, the hemisphere. But um, a site-based approach, is, while it's critical, it's definitely not going to be sufficient. And and so thinking about some of you know in terms of the earlier talk in terms of climate change, sea level rise, um, we've got to you know think in that longer term for individual sites, but also how do we enhance? How do we build? redundancy um, to, to uh, build in, you know, as sites change, you know, to preserve the network, to preserve the flyway in and above individual um, sites. So, thank you. Okay, Dr. Julie Lockhart is next. Another scientist. Um, and I, I hope you're appreciating this is, these two scientists are, based here in the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, uh, and it sort of reflects our problem orientation. Uh, and also just, again, how much these scientists bring to their own observations to us, to telling us what the problems are, right? Rock? <laughs> Okay, I promise to keep it in five minutes so David can slip in. But uh, my research is on invasive species and uh, in general on biodiversity redistribution and biodiversity loss. So we talk a lot, about the, the other big player, I would say, or the co-signature uh, of the Anthropocene is the redistribution and loss of biodiversity. And I'm saying redistribution and loss on purpose. We talk about loss of biodiversity as species extinctions, but really what's happening on a sub-species extinction level is that we are massively redistributing the species we have across the globe. So we're doing that in a lot of different ways. And one of those is through um, human actions that either accidentally on purpose pick up individuals of different species and move them well outside of where they have evolved and then drop them into a new place. So those species we in general will call non-native species. Those are, um, we move an enormous number of species every single day within ships ballast water, within the cargo on uh, accident that's in the cargo or that they are the cargo. So think about exotic pets that you might buy or find at um, Walmart or the species that you buy at, Wal at um, Home Depot for your garden, but all kinds of other species that we move around on purpose. And then there's a ton of species that just move around um, on those structures as well. They also move on our cars, which we know as well. So those things are the definition of a non-native species is one that occurs well outside of its evolutionary history, recent evolutionary history, and got to that location by a direct or because of human actions. There's a lot of gray area there, especially in relate to what's going to happen with climate change. But at the moment, that's a good working definition and it's been adopted by several global institutions and in other regulatory and sort of governance contexts. Another key thing is we don't tend to call those species as invasive until they have demonstrable economic, social, cultural, or ecological effects. So uh, from that, I think the and one of the sort of things I want to bring home there is that we tend to think about invasive species as an ecological area of study, but in fact, it's a huge area of study, and we've, we tend to move out of thinking about it as invasion ecology and talk about it as an invasion science because what we're, the drivers of what happens with invasive species are inherently um, cultural, social, transportation, global change, all of that. 
and the impacts also cross all those areas as well. So those, those, when you say something is invasive and it has an impact, that includes ecological impact, including species extinctions, which they occasionally cause. They also cause an, uh, trillions of dollars in economic impacts over the last 10 years and continuing to grow exponentially. They cause social impacts, which you can kind of feel when you go outside and are dealing with um, spotted lantern flies at the moment. Um, and they cause cultural impacts, for example, the loss of ash trees for indigenous um, communities just north of us that where ash trees serve as a cultural cut, touchstone in their in their history. So that's another area where it crosses all sort of boundaries. So by definition, invasive species are cross jurisdictional problems and they qualify as wicked problems um, in no small part too, because of the fact that any one species can be considered to have a negative impact in one place and a positive impact someplace else. Or that same one species can have a be considered to have a negative impact in the same place and positive impact in that same place. And those differences in values and how you're viewing that species determine whether or not you classify this as a positive or negative effect. And in fact, when you poll people from all cultures that are dealing with invasive species, the same individual can see, can look at a species and see both positive and negative impacts. So it's a really complex question that is not easily solved by one discipline or one international treaty. Okay. Now my phone doesn't want, oh, there we go. So to me, um, so those I think relate to normative perhaps conflicts. So that was a term that I th that came to mind when I was thinking about this. The p complexities around governance then to me fall into three areas. The decisions and risk evaluations are fragmented at every spatial scale you can imagine, mostly by taxonomic differences. Those taxonomic differences uh, are transferred into um, governance differences. So for example, right outside our door, we have invasive plants, we have invasive insects, and we might even have an invasive animal or two, like an earthworm. In New Jersey, the governance, the policy, the piece that deals with that are completely different. So even in one piece of land, what's happening to that piece of land is governed by multiple entities and they don't tend to talk. That's true as you go up from the state level in the US to the US to international agreements. So how you deal with marine invasions, they don't talk to the people who deal with freshwater invasions or they don't accept in certain situations. Risks are evaluated based on geographical location. There is no one global risk map or understanding of what invasive species risk looks like. The costs and benefits are highly asymmetric across ecosystem sections and cultures, and those are difficult to deal with. I see here from the other one that there's lots of uncoordinated scissors moving through there right now and with no real effort to deal with the underlying mechanistic reasons why we're, we're continuing and are going to uh, have to um, step up our, our focus on, on um, invasive species. And one final point that relates to David's point earlier on, invasive species management is one of the few environmental uh context from my experience where governance has come from the bottom up so in the absence of a coordinated global effort and recognition of what's happening with invasive species then local communities are organizing and doing their own thing and they are everywhere so that's another be interesting i've seen a couple of uh, academic literature on what those complexities and networks look like when they pop up and bubble up from the bottom Thank you, Julie. And uh, finally, uh, our commentator, uh, last commentator will be David Hughes. And um, I will just say in advance, he's going to have to leave uh, soon. So I want you to prepare your questions for him first. Uh, and then Rick Lathrop will have to leave after that. So he will be next. <laughs> OK, thanks, everybody. I'm in the Department of Anthropology here. Um, actually, I may not even have time to get to my own research because I have so much to say in response to Rax uh, and Tyler's presentations. Um, on this question of utopia, so Tyler referred to a utopia using that word, and I think you called it, uh, uh, Rack, the global ecological integrity grunt norm. Uh, um, these are both uh, I, I think you agree that you, you established this utopia and then this, this, and then as secondary concerns, you might want to deal with questions of distribution, fairness, justice, equality, and so on. 
Um, I think that's the thinking underlying E.O. Wilson's notion of a half Earth as well, that you establish something like half of the terrestrial area of the world as national parks, and then you deal with the displacement of a billion people or so on, and their concerns, and their immiseration and poverty and death and so on, as a, a later a secondary issue. Um, I think that's not going to work. Um, because most of the people in the world are poorer than us in this room and have suffered from climate change, the climate crisis already, which is unequal in every aspect. And I think they would want to change that, reverse that set of priorities and say that the utopia has got to involve some question of equality, equality maybe even redress and reparations. So it's a non-starter, I think, to put questions of justice second, right? Because we all know that utopians often don't ever get to the secondary questions. They get so megalomaniacally fixated on utopian question. Um, and this gets down to my, uh, my misgivings about governance. Um, governance is a euphemism, I think, for power. Uh, Alan uh, touched on some of this. And so like a euphemism, uh, like any euphemism, it, it hides more than it reveals. Um, and I'd say, therefore, that the solutions proposed so far have fallen within this narrow envelope of capitalism and nation states, which historically are not that old as formations and have never existed in the ecological conditions that we're entering now. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we exceed that envelope in thinking about ways of re 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 uh, realigning, redistributing power in the Anthropocene. Um, actually, I hate this phrase, Anthropocene. Let's talk about redistributing power at plus two, somewhere in the range of plus two to plus six degrees centigrade. Um, and you may say that I'll re recommend that because I'm some sort of a socialist and so on, and the social movements uh, that are fighting for climate justice are influenced by socialism, and all that's true. But I think also this, these ideas seem of... of redistribution, social justice, and so on, seem a little bit outlandish in this room because of the particular historical interregnum we're in right now. So it's a little bit of historical context setting. Um, we're in the period before, let, let me borrow a phrase from Kim Stanley Robinson, the social science fiction, science fiction writer who's sort of taken as an oracle in many ways. He talks in his novel, New York 2140, he talks about now, as the period immediately before the first pulse, when there was an immediate rise in sea level because of a glacial surge. I can't remember if he says it's Antarctica or Greenland. And when I read the novel, it came out a few years ago, I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, that's just his, 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 he's a very deep reader of science too. That's just his scenario. And then I read in the spring when the findings came out about the Thwaites, Thwaites Glacier, otherwise known as the Doomsday Glacier in Antarctica, which is kind of teetering, held up by a thread, which is the small seamount, and is expected to slide off by serious glaci glaciologists, expected to slide off into the Southern Ocean by around 2030, giving us 65 centimeters in sea level rise just about right away. So I think that's likely to happen. Um, and that's likely to unsettle all of the assumptions behind the, behind the nation state and behind capitalism. You can imagine 100 to 200 million people displaced in South Asia, Vietnam, and so on. Um, and coming, trying to get to either dying or trying to get to the global north, putting pressure on, putting rightfully putting pressure on ideas of sovereignty. You can also imagine uh, Miami becoming uninhabitable for business, uh, maybe parts of New York becoming uninhabitable for business, Houston. Uh, you can imagine a collapse in our economy in the US and in the world economy. So. If we anticipate that sort of thing, that first pulse happening, it would be wise for us to prepare a soft landing and anticipate what a post-capitalist world might look like uh, and start making it possible now so that we can transition into it and what a post-nation state world might look like so we can transition into it in a, and, and have a soft landing for the people who really matter, which are those 200 million displaced people. Um, just once, so my small research idea, which I don't have any time to discuss, I have been pursuing through ethnography in Spain, 
in the context of large scale wind farms, I've been pursuing the idea of a wind commons, public ownership of wind resource, which right now is being appropriated by private firms, um, a development that's causing opposition to wind farms. So that's just one idea, but the larger context is what really matters. And I've got to go in about five minutes. So to start the, start the panel, maybe. Thank you. All right, who wants to have at David Hughes? <laughs> Brick, if you could come up and Julie as well and Rack. But, but I'm inviting questions for David first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I want to bring out the point that you made about thinking about the future. Um, so you put your perspective about right out there. I'm coming from a socialist uh, way of envisioning the future. I'm just thinking about post-capitalist kind of future. Um, it comes from a particular perspective, right? So I wanted to ask you in your vision, who gets to say what the future has to look like? And we heard a lot about transformation of societies and stuff. So what would you propose as a solution to that? Who gets to say what the future has to look like? And who gets to participate in that talk? Who would you put in that group of stakeholders? That's for you. That's, for me. <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge, huge question, uh, Vic. Um, I mentioned social movements before, which doesn't really answer your question. That just points towards a whole different set of actors. Um, I think that partly uh, a lot of this work should be peace, will be, and should be piecemeal. Um, so I work on the in the kind of space around energy justice and energy democracy, and particularly in Europe, there are a whole lot of social movements saying that energy infrastructure should be publicly owned and therefore, and managed then towards decarbonization. And my little contribution is to say that the uh, wind, wind and sunlight should also be publicly owned. But these movements exist. Um, they are getting more and more traction. Um, and I think partly it's, it's helpful for, for observers to stand out of the way and, cre and, and stop, and, and part of um, a, a, a discipline, um, or a discourse which assumes capitalism and the nation state actually is standing in the way of a broader imagination. So that's what I would say. I mean, you know, should we, uh, how, how, how should one cope with the people of the Pacific Atolls who are also, whose, whose nation states will disappear uh, in the first pulse? Um, you know, it would be helpful for us to at least create space in the United States for a discussion of open borders to such people, right? Um, and, and therefore, we shouldn't begin by assuming that there are 200 nation states each exercising sovereignty. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I can't, can't give you a list of 10 people who are going to be in charge of this transformation. But I think there are a lot of social movements that can be enabled and at least not obstructed by scholarship. I think Tyler wanted to comment since David kind of brought him in as oh, well. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, David, for the, uh, those are very provocative, thought provoking uh, questions. I, I agree with you that a pulse is coming. I don't know when. Um, I would agree with you that, that the climate change is a danger to nation states, but not, not nation states in particular. I think that climate change is a danger to democratic nation states. And there's not any reason I, I would see that, that authoritarian nation states could evolve and, and keep this system going. But in, in saying that a pulse is coming and that there will be this transition to a new system, you seem to be acknowledging that, or can, that mitigation might not prevent that pulse. There's a counter argument that, that solar geoengineering, if it were to happen, it could work to prevent that pulse and also, secondly, there's an argument that, that the Global South might be the strongest advocates for solar geoengineering since the Global South are the ones that are suffering, will suffer and are suffering the most from climate change. 
All right, so we have a question uh, from online that uh, we're going to have read out here. Yeah, please. Oh. oh, here it is. Okay, what are some possible alternatives to nation states? What issues do they address and or raise? I think that's yours. <laughs> After this, I have to go. After this one, I have to go, yeah. Um, oh, alternative to nation states. So. Um, one of the things that came up in the COP uh, of 20, 2009 in, um, in Denmark was this figure of $100 billion that the Global North would fork over to the Global South for adaptation. Um, and it, it's never been paid, um, but there was a kind of agreement among governments that that would be the way to handle it. Because if you're a government in the Global South, well, you get a big chunk of change. If you're a government in the global north, you pay only money. Um, one of the things that I think will also happen after the first pulses, we'll start to go back to physiocratic thinking about economics, um, where uh, we think about resources, we think about life, we think about freedoms and so on as the real currencies. So if freedom is the real currency here, then what the global north does not want to give up is passports. They would rather pay $100 billion than pay 100 million passports. Um, but I think that's what it's going to take. Um, and, and this might be negotiable under a nation state framework. I mean, this might be negotiable where nation states in the temperate zone, which have food supplies and, um, and still have, main, have livable cities, um, they, they might remain. And if they're generous enough or compelled enough through unrest and war, they might then open their borders and one could imagine a transfer of populations, right? From zones that are unsafe to zones that are safe. Um, and I actually, to, to, to one, what I recommend everybody read Mohsen Hamid's, or maybe it's Hamid, no, Mohsen Hamid's novel, um, Exit West. He's a Pakistani writer who, who de and he's writing in the context of climate change, but it's climate change is really in the background. And he talks about, a scenario where all of a sudden there are doors that take one from Lahore to London and in all other city pairs. They're magical doors. They open up and people move and it causes all sorts of riots and things in London. And then people, after a few years, get over it. And there is this incredible redistribution of world population through these doors. Um, so that, that's my utopia, actually. Um, <laughs> where we go back to, in fact, a pre-nation state, maybe even you might even call it imperial formation, where people can move to safety. It's necessary, um, and I'd like us to see, and, I, and it's unfortunate that it takes novelists to think in this ways and open up our imagination. People who don't even have PhDs are actually doing better thinking about the future, I think. So I've got a dash here. I'm sorry, I have to teach my first class. Thank you all. <laughs> Leaving a, thank you, David. Um, yeah, and I do uh, really appreciate that uh, this is the first week of class, so a lot of our faculty are dipping in and out, and uh, Rick is the next one to go. So um, I guess, uh, I know, Amanda, you have a question? Um, did someone bring her the microphone? Oh, sorry, excuse me, go ahead. Light was on. Uh, Gabriella Kutting, uh, Rutgers Newark. Um, so I actually had a question for David, but he's left. But never mind, I think Rag can help me too. So I wanted to uh, pick up on David's um, comment about how um, global environmental governance is basically driven by power considerations. And um, uh, ultimately, what we see in most of the literature is a sort of writing away of those power relations they don't really they're, they're not really brought out you know we're talking about management and management uh, uh, of, of issues management is a sort of um it's a very nice term to sort of ignore who makes the decisions and who gets decided on so um so i wanted to basically take what david said and apply it to your talk and and ask you um what do you think would need to happen in global environmental governance to sort of be more uh, to make those power relations more visible and to overcome the limitations that those power relations bring to global environmental governance? Uh, 
Okay, thank, uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, I think there, the, um, there are many power uh, asymmetries in, in global environmental governance between states, between also different groups of people, NGOs, transnational networks, uh, corporates. Um, and these are, the differences are actually um, not, as you say, not made visible, um, at least also including in academic literature. I think it's changing a little bit. More and more people are um, um, researching power in global governance. Um, but um, in my research, I, I actually don't <laughs> focus on power imbalances, but I do really um, think, I agree, fully agree that this is a very important topic. Um, how can we make it more visible? I mean, it will become more visible um, one, one way or another. Um, but just to link to the discussions that we've been having about tipping and um, the, the purse, etc. Um, I mean, the Earth System scientists have identified uh, 15 to 20 tipping elements in the Earth System, including such as the Amazon uh, forest, West Antarctic ice sheet, etc. And some of these tipping elements uh, uh, are found within national jurisdiction. So, uh, and, and if the uh, um, Amazon uh, is left to degrade and, and to be deforested um, in the coming years, it's going to turn into a savanna all of a sudden. It's going to go through a regime shift. So to, if we were to prevent it from happening, um, we cannot just tell Brazil to not do it, right? <laughs> um, we need to come up with some sort of a compensa compensatory mechanism or we need to again sort of think of a, another alternative model to nation states. I don't know what that might look like. But yes, I mean, that's um, yeah, that, I think that's 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 uh, something that we need to start thinking about, um, and and also I think it's 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 it has something to do with power imbalances. I mean, global north and south, um, and the redistribution of resources and and, and power, which also David talked about. Um, well, I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm not the right person to. I'm sorry, if that's the best I can do. But anyone else has um, better. Well, I, I would, um, so Aaron earlier talked about organizations, right? And um, so power is not held by individuals, it's held by organizations. And uh, any individual who owns property, for example, is uh, the property rights are protected by a particular state arrangement. And capitalism also depends on those things, right? So, so, so there is no free floating power. And I think one of the one of the approaches one of the things that's really interesting about your approach is that you're looking at networks not just of organizations you're looking at interconnections among institutions meaning uh you know does the cbd cite um you know the ipcc um and and that i think we have to look at if if david you know if we take david's um you know various comments there is no free floating power so what does it mean if these things change? You know, we've been, people have said for years, oh, the, the, the um, you know, the state is fading, right? It hasn't faded yet, right? Even despite having all these international relationships. The organizations that uh, we've heard about from both Julie and uh, Rick are uh, uh, networks. They're really looking at networks and you work within networks. Both of them, I think, describe networked, um, you know, connection. So I, I, I think you have the beginning of something in your own data, you know, uh, that gets at, um, you know, rather than treating power as like a concrete block. Uh, so at any rate, that's just something to throw out there. And I, and I think Julie's comment about the bottom up aspect was also important, really. So what's going to continue to support these things? Um, I think someone else had, uh, okay, Amanda, go ahead and Well, uh, uh, Karen, what you just said kind of was what I was going to say, but I can kind of um, frame it in a different way to be more concrete for rock specifically. I was also thinking about like the you're using networks to describe like whether there is coordination or not, and like um, the and then you you mentioned this idea of like if we really want coordination, we may actually have to like 
destroy existing institutions, the institutions that you're describing. Some of them may have to like go away or, so, um, you know, we get rid of them. And that is a power loss for those people who are like working in those institutions. And I presume those people will be pretty mad if you're like, we're going to get rid of this and they're probably going to be mad about losing their power. So my question is like, have you already, other examples of that having already happened and how did that kind of like shift of power in that way occur? Or is there other examples within network, networks in general? Because I know like nothing about networks, but I presume people who have studied other form of networks also see examples of either a re-coordination or redistribution of power that arose in some sort of conflict, but was necessary in order to get effective coordination. Um, has that successfully happened in other places that may not be relevant to environmental governance, but is a type of network? And if so, like, how do we apply those lessons from there to this in these cases? OK, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably start by saying networks are very stable forms of organization it's difficult to change their form um, and, and also well it's in a network you find many different individual no, dots and nodes uh, which seem all the same but there are central nodes and there are also nodes that are also some in, in periphery so the ones that are in in the center are, um, have more connections basically uh, which um, mean sort of in, in that they are, their authority is, is recognized uh, by others. So if they are given more power by other actors interacting with the more central node. So, um, and, and what is interesting in a network of complex systems is that this power distribution is, it follows a, what's, law, what's called power law actually. Um, so um, there is always a very few nodes in, a, in, in any complex network and system that have most number of nodes, uh, sorry, links in the system. So if you look at, for, for example, I mean, the internet, the, the, the web, um, which do you think has the most number of links? Google, right? So, uh, and, and whereas vast majority of um, uh, entities on the internet have small number of, relatively small number of links. So this power distribution uh, imbalance, you know, that look is enormous. Uh, um, and I don't think it can be, I don't know. I mean, of course, we need to. This is a dilemma I face sometimes. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, it's natural. The power imbalance is naturally found in any system, in any real world system. But, but maybe at some point, it's. Too, I mean, um, um, in our economic system, for example, this power imbalance um, reaches a point where it's not, it's not natural anymore, and it therefore becomes fragile and un unstable, and and mm. has to collapse before it can sort of find its balance again. Um, I don't think this answers the question, but that's what I wanted to share as, mm. as a reflection. Um, yeah. Yeah, Rick, please. I can just give a small example um, related to some of the work that I'm involved in, more at a local level. And so I talked about, you know, this network of conservation, you know, individual sites. So this is at a, a particular site in terms of Delaware Bay. And one of the local, each site has a different series of conflicts. And so um, one of the conflicts within Delaware Bay is the potential between um, oyster aquaculture versus the, the birds. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service has a responsibility for the, the birds, but they basically devolve that responsibility to a small group of stakeholders. Yeah. Five greens, people interested in the birds, five from the oyster aquaculture people, throw them in a room and basically you guys work it out, okay? You know, in terms of how do these stakeholders kind of work it out, you know, within the framework of, of some of laws and, and regulations. But so there's, there's this trying to share this power between them two. Um, and then I think, but I've been, I've been one of those members on that, on that group um, is, is really the goodwill between the different groups work trying to work together um, rather than one group trying to wield power you know to get their way uh, and so I, I think overall it's been you know reasonably 
successful to this point, but again, it's just small groups that, that work with each other on a variety of different contexts um, and, and trying to think about that broader system, not just their particular interests. Um, but, you know, we've only been at it four years, three, four years, and so we'll see how it's successful, you know, uh, in the future. So, Rick, if you could, um, you know, one of the aspects that he's pointing out is that this has to be within a context, right? So you were convened by the entity that has the authority, yes. right? And uh, whether or not it has the power to go with the authority, because a lot of times we have laws that don't even have enforcement mechanisms, right? Or they, they're underfunded or the like, but it was within the protective, um, you know, realm of the Fish and Wildlife Service that this set of discussions took place, right? right. So, so uh, and the other thing I would ask you is um, who get, who, uh, how do individuals gain authority of influence within groups like that? Because I think, again, I, I'm thinking a lot of the things that Rack was talking about, integrity, about the norms, et cetera, these are the sorts of things that you're saying are happening in this group. How does that happen? What, what's your, you know, experience of that? Well, in terms of the, the composition of the group, you know, partly they're representing different interests. And so they're, um, you know, in, in some ways, of, you know, a chair of this committee or a head of this, you know, in, um, uh, group in terms of the aquaculturists or academic. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. So um, as well as, as local government, but it's not um, at this point been open to anyone interest, you know, that wants to come in. They're kind mm -hmm. of part of a, of another group or particular stakeholder. So Julie, what about um, that same question to you in the realms that you've dealt with? How do people get authority to speak and influence each other on these, you know, maybe just think of a particular instance they, I mean, it, it seemed to me like what you were saying is they just care, right? Someone starts caring and that that itself has some moral authority. Yeah, so the, the um, bubbling up groups are those that care. So they see something that they care about being lost at the hands of uh, where they can identify an invasive species as being a component of that loss. So they organize themselves and um, and claim some element of, of power so that that could be energizing the public to do something about it. That could be getting grants to, to, for themselves to do something about it. They don't necessarily work within the governance system. Like they don't necessarily work within the state, right? The state mechanism. Sometimes the, sometimes they talk to the state people who are responsible for regu regulating what's going on or the, and they often will talk to the landowners. So yeah, they gain, um, authority by claiming it. Yeah, so very interesting. Tom Rudell has the mic. No. No. Wait. Thank you. There. Um, so it's a question for Rack. It, it seems to me that most of what you're talking about with interinstitutional coordination are actually examples of something that political scientists call uh, corporatism. So corporatism, and it, actually the best examples of it are Northern European, it, uh, Netherlands, Germany, Austria, Sweden. These are situations where governments get together with peak associations, businesses, and labor and they concert their activities it's usually usually these kinds of coordinations are crisis driven so actually they could be applied at much smaller scales and i think uh, rick and julie's examples are are pertinent in, in, in that regard so i guess what i would encourage you to do is to think try to think of these patterns of networking and coordination as examples of of corporatism okay thank you very much for that um suggestion <laughs> I'll look into this um, co so corporatism okay yes I'll, I'll look into it um, 
So this is this is a concept that um, social so sociologists use quite a lot. Yes. Uh, in in particular, uh, thinking about uh, cooperation between labor unions and government uh, in Europe, right? So that's sort of where this first came about, corporations, labor unions, government working together on workforce development and the like, right? And, and that, that that could be a model where you have these defined roles that bring people to the table. And, um, and obviously, that's not a model that's happened in the United States. United Nations, you mean? Oh, no, in the United States, States yeah. Okay. So we're unfamiliar <laughs> with it here. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can... Uh... Bring the concept into United Nations. Oh, there you go. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, Michelle Scobie from the University of the West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so I like to be devil's advocate sometimes. I think Rock knows that. Uh, how do we design institutions that can be effective? So I started off as a lawyer and what I realized was that most international environmental agreements determined what is the least damage that we, can, we allowed, what the law allows us to do to damage the environment. All of them state the boundaries that are allowable legally, even though those boundaries aren't what the environment needs. If you look at CBD, if you look at UNFCCC framework, etc. So if the law doesn't solve the problem, and if the institutions we create are to manage but not solve the problem, is the solution looking at institutions? And if it's not looking at institutions, because we basically analyze why we can't solve the problem, what would be the solution? And that leads me, I mean, there are these crazy ideas about ending states and everybody being one happy family. But it leads me to ask, is the issue really a question of a common morality? And is there space for that within the analysis of institutions and institutional frameworks? OK, thank you. Is it a question for me? Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a, I, I don't know that I can, that's such a big question, so I'm sure I'm going to fall short of that. But there's a couple of things that I've been thinking about and related to the last question as well. It's like what causes an institution to change and then maybe effectiveness of the institution. And um, my one factor is just crisis. Hmm. So that can be a you know, the, the origin of that crisis can come from a lot of different areas. It could be from the thing it's trying to manage. So from my point of view, invasive species, the need to reorganize how we deal with them um, is because of the crisis of the number of species that are coming in and causing a problem. And the number of sectors that it, the old way that we have organized it by agricultural interests report to the ag thing, and then the forest interests report to the forest thing, and the rain system are, are, um, don't work because they were developed um, in the 1950s and 60s and the crisis is so much higher than it is now. So will they? Uh, that's a really good question, but I, I think you start to see that, re I, I see that reorganization around invasive species because of the magnitude of the crisis. Um, there also could be funding crisis, there could be other social crises that may, that may force that reorganization, but. I think it's rare that an institution reorganizes on its own. So that, that might relate to you have a normal, normal level of power imbalance, and then you have an abnormal level of power imbalance that the forces of power crisis, in essence, and then it reorganizes. So, um, you know, that's pretty good because that's what organizational theory teaches us. So good for you. All right. Well, I just, <laughs> I just, I just thought it all up myself. <laughs> that's right. Um, like effectiveness is another really good question. And I try to think about which, which organizations, which governance structures are the most effective. Um, and it's almost like it's a conflict between my saying, oh, we have a lot of scissors clipping away at this problem, but we never address the central one. And then my thinking about what are the most effective organizations? <laughs> And those are the ones that are often the closest to the problem. Mm -hmm. So then I'm like saying fragmentation is a problem, but fragmentation is also the solution. Mm -hmm. So 
I, that's a problem that I think is really difficult to grapple with for all the reasons that we've, we've, we've come up with. Yeah, that's my best guess. Um, thanks for the very challenging question. <laughs> Just to, uh, I, think, I think you're questioning whether we actually need to, I don't know, stick to institutions, I mean, basically, uh, given that they have not been effective so far. Is it more or less? No. Um, it, it reminds me of a research paper that I've recently read, who studied um, 2000 or so international agreements, whether they've been effective. And the conclusion is that um, most of them have failed to achieve the intended effects. Um, the most successful, effective ones are the ones that had enforcement mechanism in it. Um, of course, it's, it's, it's not possible to determine whether the, the presence of enforcement mechanism actually led to more effectiveness or is it just a random co correlation? Um, but um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, so and I don't think, I, I still have faith in institutions, international institutions. Uh, I think there's a way to make them more effective and, and better designed. But of course, in doing so, you may um, lose some states from signing uh, and, and joining this, the, the treaty. For example, um, so there's a difficult balance to strike, and that has not been possible so far. Um, but we, I, I don't think it's. I mean, I don't want to sort of give up on institutions, but rather we need to think of a different form of institution. Um, maybe also by killing some, which I think was mentioned before, which are not effective, rather than keeping them as zombie institutions with some coal, right? They just consume resources and they just exist there and operate, but doing nothing. And actually, maybe they they could lead to adverse impact, um, but repurposing them or re giving them new life, for example. I mean, these are all um, imaginary, yes, wild ideas, but I think we are here for imagining the <laughs> new type of environmental governance in the Anthropocene. So I think I'm, I'm yeah, I'm maybe allowed to imagine. <laughs> So we keep coming back to enforcement, uh, I think, uh, sort of in various ways. And so I guess I, I would um, maybe it links to a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, is another way of talking about enforcement is implementation. So we've talked about that, you know, here and there. But um, if you don't have a nation state that is signed on, on to a treaty and is ready to enforce it by putting those treaty obligations into their national law and providing enforcement mechanisms, right? So that's the whole model. Um, so I don't know, any, any comments from either of you about what you've seen for variations in enforcement that could happen other than the sort of, you know, you set a law and then you have a, a designated enforcement agency. Right, so we earlier today we, we were hearing about you know the the siloed problem, right? That's how we've structured enforcement. Um, what other models have you seen, if any? So, in the context of invasive species, the models are legal. Those are remarkably ineffective. Um, there's um, disincentives that you can set up. Those are geared towards businesses that maybe have as a byproduct or or sometimes not a byproduct of, of resulting in invasive species. So there's an economic cost associated with what they're doing that can be imposed by a nation state or by a treaty. Um, and so the lack of compliance in some way. So phytosanitary regula plant regulations are an example of that. So there's quarantines and inspections that happen at the borders of most countries. And if you found you're in violation of that, then they won't let your goods in. And so you, you have to turn the ship around and go home. So that's a, a financial cost. Um, mm -hmm. There's also an incentive to get around those by cheating. But um, and then another way is through um, industry best practices. So those have arisen in some of these, like in the horticultural industry. So you, you get buy in from the industries themselves who feel like they have a social um, uh, imperative there and what, sort of what they're doing. And then you also have a consumer enforcement. So you, you sort of, it's like the um, getting the seafood list from the Monterey Bay Aquarium where you don't, you're encouraged not to eat different seafood because it has high costs in terms of ecosystem function or, or other things. 
So it's the same in terms of what species you buy and, you know, don't, don't buy a Burmese python if you think you're not going to keep it for the 40 years of its life and you're <laughs> going to get rid of it by letting it go. So there's, there's consumer education and um, a, a bottom-up consumer kind of enforcement. Rack, anything comes to mind for you? Um, uh, is, instead of uh, give, giving an example, I mean, I, I think, um, uh, so it's, going back to um, what Alan, I think, was talking about, uh, you know, when he mentioned about wearing a seatbelt uh, and, and, and also linking uh, this, that with this, this question about enforcement. I mean, there's a, um, why do we wear a seatbelt? I mean, is it because we, are, we fear penalty uh, um, or the fear of the, the, the the penalty that we might face if we get caught, or because we, we really have internalized the um, the norm that 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 uh, that we need to wear a seat belt um, mm -hmm. for myself and for society, and I think that's what uh, sort of this rather than having to sort of have, have a enforcement mechanisms and we, uh, the states follow international law because they fear of being sanctioned or being given penalties. My utopia is where states and various actors have really internalized norms um, mm -hmm. to the extent that they don't have to actually worry about sanctions and penalties and enforcement. Um, and I think, well, according to some scholars, that is actually why, why most states obey international law. Um, why most international rules are being followed and complied with. Um, it's not because of enforcement, it's because of the internalization of norms. Right, so that's partly why I was drawing attention to your networks, right? Because the networks are um, mutual spheres, of, they're spheres of mutual influence, right? And the, and the expectations are shared through those network connections. Another thing I would mention would be the sort of work some that um, Rachel Schwamm has worked on. We can think about behavioral changes as well. So very interesting things about telling people, um, apparently one of the most effective things you can say is your neighbors are saving energy. This is how their energy use compares to yours, right? And um, just providing very targeted information um, or uh, even, you know, some, some of the people on campus have done various experiments with um, putting in electricity monitors into people's homes so they actually know which appliances are using what, because the marketplace has not provided that, right? So, so what can we do to provide the right information to the right people and then, um, you know, does it matter to someone whether they have, an, you know, a native, um, you know, New Jersey species versus a very similar invasive species, probably most people if given the choice would say, oh, that sounds great, you know, I'll have the New Jersey one, but they don't, they're, they're not told that, right? You don't go into Home Depot and see it labeled, you know, you could have this choice of that because that's, so, so you know, another, another aspect could be a market aspect, you know, so are there value added to having a native species? Right. What, what could you how could you build those? So so in other words, it's not just necessarily laws on one hand and values on the other. There are all these other intervening things. And that's, you know, broadly speaking, that's how we define institutions. Institutions aren't just organizations. They are accepted practices within a certain context. Right. Um, yeah, Vic. Yeah, and I wanted to go back to some of the things that Michelle was was pointing out especially the idea of like ethics and values and morals and tied it up to what Karen was saying in terms of behavior and internalized norms um, so if you look at the classic tragedy of the commons paper Harding was always saying don't rely on temperance that doesn't happen but I think you propose a very interesting point when you're talking about secondary norms that in anthropology we would call secondary organizations, which are, we look at them as more of community-based type of social structures that reinforce cultural values. And um, I think it's like, a, I, it brings back a lot of like a classic sociology to me 
in terms of this idea of like reinforcing those norms. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, what do you have in mind when you're talking about secondary norms? What, what would be a good example of that? Um, thank you. I, I'm, uh, first of all, really happy to hear that uh, what I shared has sort of been useful in kind of <laughs> bringing back some memories. <laughs> uh, um, yes, as an example, I mean, there are, for example, I mean, there is a, there's a provision in the law of the sea convention saying when you address, uh, when states address marine pollution, or, uh, uh, for example, you must not transfer harm to another area, to another form of environmental problem. So this is kind of a secondary norm um, that I think, for, in my view, a, any treaty should have. So in, in, address, in, in trying to achieve its own objective, it should not undermine the, the objective of other treaties, for example. I mean, um, and when there is a conflict between two treaties, normative conflict between any environmental treaties, there should be some sort of a guidance given on how to address the conflict. Um, and I think in that regard, a, a higher order norm, whatever we want to call it, group norm or overarching goal, is going to be very useful as an arbiter. Um, because otherwise, it's always going to be kind of a piecemeal approach to conflict resolution. So is, it sounds like what you're talking about in the United States is called the rule of law, or what's actually called that in many places. That is rules about rules? Yeah. Yes, rules about rules. Okay. Met Meta-governance, basically. Governance of governance. Yes. Governance of governance, yeah. Yes. Any other questions people have? Because I know lunch is being set up, so uh, <laughs> we don't want to get in the way of people's lunch. Uh, we do have a, a comment from uh, Marjorie. Kaplan, who could not be here, uh, so she wants to announce uh, that she's been working with the university partners at the University Climate Change Coalition, Second Nature, and uh, Ringo's constituency on a three-part webinar series to help people gear up for the COP27 with a great lineup of speakers. Uh, and so I'm going to leave this up on the screen. People can uh, look this up. Uh, thank you so much, Marjorie. Really appreciate that and wish you could be here. Um, thank you. Uh, the, um, there is also, uh, does anybody have the information about the uh, webinar series for climate change that was uh, by uh, extension? We should probably get that information and put that up. That'll be um, offered up in the near future. All right, so I think, uh, I think we'll wrap it up uh, and really thank everybody uh, for their excellent questions. And thank you, Rack and Julie, the remaining two, <laughs> very much. So we will have lunch now. Please um, feel free to uh, go ahead and get your lunch, and we will reconvene at lunch, everyone. I saw lots of great conversations happening, so it was great to see those connections being made um, over some good food. And welcome to the students who have joined us for the afternoon session. We hope that you enjoy it. So our last um, keynote speaker for this afternoon is going to be Michelle Scobie. And she is at the University of the West Indies, uh, based in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and Michelle has a deep, long history in, in research on global governance architectures um, in general, but also very specifically on small island developing states. Um, so she, rec she lectures in international law and global environmental governance um, at the University of West Indies. Um, and she is an attorney at law, as well as having a PhD. So she's able to represent um, these fields in, from different perspectives. Um, so some of her recent works address policy coherence, um, the role of non-state actors, um, accountability in global environmental governance, um, equity issues um, across several topical fields from climate adaptation to biodiversity um, to solar, uh, uh, I'm just blanking. I just want to say SRM, <laughs> uh, solar radiation management, sorry, um, which we heard about this morning. So her book, Global Environmental Governance and Small Island States, or in Small States, came out in 2019 and addresses many of these questions in the context of the Caribbean. So I recommend um, folks to look at that um, after Michelle's talk. So I'll turn it over to Michelle. Welcome. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, organizers. This is a fantastic um, workshop and 
I really um, would like to applaud those who have, you know, decided to put this workshop together and the intent of creating a more stable working group on environmental governance is used as transdisciplinary. I think it's fantastic. I really encourage everybody to sign up and, and do this because I think that's, that's a big part of the solution. So <clears throat> I'm coming from environmental governance from the legal side. And my question this morning to Iraq was a bit about that, you know, um, the law doesn't seem to be solving the problems. And well, Iraq is, is and I are part of an aid systems governance network, recognizing that we need to go beyond perhaps one discipline to understand the challenges of, that we face more as a, as a system, yeah, uh, which would include many disciplines. So I am here to speak today about the um, participation, you know, so what makes for good participation in environmental governance. And uh, I'm not going to spend much of my time asking questions, but I just want you to think, when you think about participation in environmental governance, what do you think about, you know? To be who participates, participates where, participates how, participates when. And you might wonder, why do I have a monkey with a plastic <laughs> bottle up? Yeah. Well, there's a lot that we can say about this first slide. Yeah. Um, one is that uh, we great human beings have found a way to transport water in small quantities around the globe. And, and that provides jobs for many people. So it's something good, yeah? And, uh, and then you see the little monkey here, you know, looking at this bottle and, uh, and probably he's not looking at it in the same way. And when you think about participation, you have uh, an institution or forum with people looking at the same issue from very different perspectives, yeah? So I'm gonna draw a little bit on my experience um, as, as one of the people that support our Caribbean negotiation, negotiators in the BBNJ Treaty, Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. And I'm also going to speak as an observer of the first, well, the second workshop on solar radiation management for Latin America and the Caribbean that happened two weeks ago. In both of those cases, um, I thought I was asked, you know, to think about it from the perspective of participation. And you have multiple actors in both cases with very different backgrounds, very different sets of priorities. And so the question as to what is the best participation for the Anthropocene, uh, it's, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one because of this variety of actors that we have, because of the variety of perspectives. Yeah? So you have multiple actors, you have multiple species, you have future generations. So this little monkey is looking at this bottle what does this mean for his um, successors? You know, will they have more of those bottles? Will they have less, uh, less space within which to operate? Will these bottles affect them positively or negatively? Um, there's several worldviews. You know, some people think it's good to have water in a bottle. Some people think um, th that that's just not the correct way to consume a resource. Yeah. So how do you begin to engage with multiple actors allowing them to participate how do we accept different views on what is the solution to the problem so there was this representative from mexico who stood up at the end of the conference and said for us the priority is healthcare we as a country cannot put resources into solar radiation management right now she says, maybe there are scientists working on it, but for us, we need to solve more basic problems. Does it mean that solar radiation management is not important? No, but her concerns should be taken into account. If I were the scientist, I would just not invite her to any more meetings. And that happens more often than we think. So what ways can we ensure that those who think differently from ourselves can still legitimately legitimately participate in shaping policy outcomes. So yeah, more questions than 
answers, yeah? So let's look today, let's begin by examining the Anthropocene, yeah? Because we're talking about participation in the Anthropocene and you know, it's a geological epoch that, uh, uh, that geologists say doesn't exist, but the point is that human beings have, have caused irreversible impacts on the environment. And we're morally bound to find a solution to some of these challenges. The impacts are not only uh, envir not only um, environmental but economic. They're moral. The solutions are political. Uh, they they become more exacerbated because of complex environmental crises, as we see um, existing today. But we also need to understand spaces, the relationships between those who have created the challenges and those who are facing the impacts of those, and those are global and local. So the human race has always depended on the environment from the first moment of its existence. And civilizations have always interacted with the environment. And we are at the stage of shaping what we leave for the future generations. And, and therefore, the context of the Anthropocene, I think, as uh, probably not ge geologically um, accurate as, a, as an epoch, uh, that context is very useful to understand the relationships between humanity and nature, and also the relationships between human beings in our relationship with nature, which is not the same thing. And, and that's where governance comes in. You know? what, what are those relationships? What are those skills? What are those ethical considerations that determine um, how we interact with nature. I don't know where I should Sorry, again. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Okay, so in overview, um, I'm going to talk about environmental governance research as a field. Um, the thematic foundations, which is a sort of schematic that I've made to try to understand the different elements when we're speaking about environmental governance. I'm going to focus on actors and agency, not the same thing, because if we're speaking about participation, I think it's interesting to look at actors and agency. I'm going to address complexity, also addressed by some of the other speakers, because I think that we can't think about solving any environmental problem without looking at the issue of complexity then architectures, framework skills, and modes of governance, and finally, power and justice. Specifically re requested by the organizers, but one of my key uh, pet topics as well, yeah. So let's look at environmental governance, first of all, you know, how to understand governance. And, uh, well, Global environmental governance, as we know, is a response to the global environmental challenges you know, that can only be solved if we were asking this question in 1972 by coordination between states. But today, few people think that that's the main only solution. In fact, now we speak more about public private coordination. So globalization includes a global mobilization of many actors you know, to deal with the issues of the Anthropocene. And good governance of the shared resource, for example, the ocean commons, you know, that are at risk of degradation because of the activities of one or few states, um, is something that has to be solved. And there's no single authority, as Rack was mentioning. The, the world doesn't have a global police force. No? So there's no single authority to manage the problem. Scientists are involved, um, artists are involved, individuals are involved, but because there is no overarching legal framework and no overarching legal authority, uh, implementation is, is difficult. So environmental governance is really multidisciplinary and environmental governance research um, re replicates that, that complexity. And the literature on environmental governance, and I think it's interesting because we have perhaps experts from many different disciplines here, and the literature on environmental governance is precisely 
um, multidisciplinary. We have international relations, those that focus on international organizations, international development, foreign policy, environmental diplomacy, environmental security, conflict resolution, ecology, ecological economics, domestic politics, sustainable development. I was at my um, sovereign wealth fund and uh, and when I thought that the decisions on the environment was made in environmental treaties, I was, I was incorrect because a lot of it depends on what the boards of governors of these sovereign wealth funds decide to invest in in the next 20 years. You know? So you could be making your, you could be doing your analysis of the impact of, of, uh, of an economic activity on biodiversity and you don't know that that last week in the Board of Governors uh, meeting, they agreed to invest X trillion dollars in this type of economic activity, which will impact on your goals for biodiversity. So the multifaceted nature of environmental governance shouldn't be ignored. And when I think each of us thinks about our area of research, it's, it's really important to understand that interconnectivity if we really want to have solutions that that can be implementable. So there are different approaches to governance. You have uh, the institutionalists that focus on the institutions, as we've seen, and the role that these institutions can play in achieving the common goals for environmental um, preservation. And, uh, and, and so the institutionalists focus on things like international law, regime design, the formation and roles of these institutions, cooperation, etc. You have the constructivist, which I, I tend to consider myself quite constructivist, think about how knowledge and ideas shape our understandings of the world, our interests, our preferences, uh, and how those things shape the practices of states you know? and coming to coming to uh, interdisciplinary uh, fora uh, we share ideas and sometimes in that sharing we shape our understandings or change our understandings of the world and that is an I think an important part of of, of governance yeah and then you have the realist of course another set of uh, another way of looking at environmental governance and in those those for, for, for the realists the real concern is the impact of environmental change on peace and the balance of power and that also can't be ignored you know we're speaking about what's the re real danger of solar radiation management nuclear war you know if states dislike what 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 happens and from the SRM meeting in 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 the region that was held just two weeks ago that was one of the main concerns if we do solar radiation management what's that going to mean for my country and I'm not going to agree to it if it's not there will be winners and losers so we can't ignore the, the power elements and the role of peace for environmental security. And then you have the environmental justice people and the critical radical political economy people. And what do they see? Well, it's important from that perspective to look at those who perhaps are often left out of participation. For different reasons and i'm going to go more into that in a bit you know? those who are critical of existing systems and structures because they if we're looking at participation they traditionally have excluded participation or they allow participation in such a way that participation is ineffective you know? over lunch we were talking about going to cop you can go to cop and not understand anything because there are just so many things to see you know and uh, uh, at the local scale, often participation and consultation uh, in government policy means the government experts going into the room, explaining to the locals why this is important. By three o'clock in the afternoons, the locals begin to understand the words that are being used and the meeting ends at four. Tick, participation, yeah? So those issues of justice, of what it means to participate, of the role of uh, knowledge and power in participation become really important. 
So I'm going to share. This is from uh, this is from from my book. Um, I try to understand what are some of those elements of uh, um, environmental governance. So I I look at uh, at the thematic foundations, global regimes, any area of environmental governance you're looking at. You have to think what's the regime. You know? So we were talking about water. It could be transboundary movement of water through rivers. It could be the oceans, and the oceans interact with the coastal ecosystems, they interact with plastics, etc., etc. So each regime is interesting. You can't say, well, what's the best form of participation? You have to look at the regime and what elements feed into that regime, what institutions feed into those regimes, and then the relationships, what structures and agency, which I'll go into in quite a bit. What about scales? You can talk about oceans at the global scale, at the regional scale. The impact of scale on oceans also depends on the size of the countries that you're speaking about, the stakeholders affected. New actors, this is often something that, that we ignore. You know, When you think about your research area, how often do you think about the new actors and do they play a role? Who are the new actors? At the BBNJ meeting, one of the first meetings that we had in the Caribbean region, guess who the actors were? Guess who were the actors that came and spoke to the Caribbean states about the importance of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction? Well, the pharmaceuticals, of course, because they're the ones that want to patent the discoveries that they find in the oceans. Yeah, and they. Anyway, this is being recorded, so I'll stop. <laughs> right, uh, sustainable development. And I use sustainable development as a catch-all for talking about norms and the importance of norms in shaping governance. And the, the value of norms also uh, determines the extent to which uh, actors are allowed to participate. You know? So participation has become a norm now in environmental governance that you should recognize the value and the importance of different actors and their ability to participate. Sustainable development has become a norm. I think interesting to understand where that came from. It came from developing states saying, sure, we want sustainability, but not without development. You know? So that whole idea of sustainable development is packed at least from the, my perspective, with a strong normative component that includes the idea of participation. And it is a consequence of the participation of many developing states that we're speaking about sustainable development and not just sustainability. So those are some of the building blocks. And then when, when is participation good? Well, it depends on the context. You know? And it's, interesting, it's important to understand the relationships of participation. It depends on the frameworks. You know? What what uh, what types of earlier when when I was hearing the speakers on the different on on the this meeting where you had five people from fisheries and five people from the bird community I thought how interesting you know a framework with these two important groups of actors would I have put other people there would you have put other people there is the framework enough to ensure the participation of all the interested stakeholders and those who could be interested in the future? The question of power, I'll go into that as well in a bit. The quality of governance. So after we do all this effort into what the governance structure should look at, like, what about the quality? Now, I could spend my entire life understanding the structure. But what does that do for better environmental outcomes and better environmental outcomes for whom? And then the norms, you know, the norms around uh, environmental governance, you know, who benefits? How do different people see the world? Yeah. Like my friend from Mexico who said, for us right now, um, health is important. Does that mean that we should ignore climate? Not at all. Or, or maybe, you know. And, and who gets to decide which norms prevail. And then the complexity underlying the building blocks of environmental governance, I, I, I pointed to. One is the contested solutions, you know, scientific uncertainty, the implementation, what, 
mean should be used for implementation, the challenges of compliance and enforcement, and then the multiple inputs. And I'm going to go into these a bit more in the, in the next part of the slide. So let me now turn to actors and agency. And uh, of course, governance scholars have often problematized the issue of context and relationships. Um, because environmental problems are not static, neither are they static in time nor in place. And the context, of course, are not limited to international, but also extend to national structures, to institutions, to architectures. So there are many what we call geographies of governance. And uh, these geographies extend across scales. They also extend across spaces regional, international, interregional. Some interregional agencies like EOSIS, EOSIS, Association of Small Island Developing States, is interregional. It, it's, it's really one region, the region of small states of the world. So we share many concerns of small states, but you know, we, we exist in, in multiple oceans, you know, and we, we like to refer to ourselves as large ocean territories, which brings with it a different perception of the world and of what is most important in environmental governance, you know. And then you have multi-networks layers of governance as well. You know, you have um, networks involving the private sector, NGOs, government, science, civil society. And, uh, and then there are multi, multiple layers, both spatially and functionally. Yeah. So you have an agency dealing with water that is linked to one dealing with biodiversity that's linked to one dealing with housing. Yeah. And, and therefore understanding these contexts and relationships uh, are important when we're speaking about participation. So there's a difference between agent and actor. I don't know if you ever thought about that. We have different actors in environmental governance, but what's agency? No? So not all actors are agents. No? An agent is, is, uh, is the actor that is able to contribute to shaping change, to shaping governance. No? Uh, so an actor may participate, but an agent shapes. So an actor with power to shape outcomes. And as somebody from a Caribbean state, I argue that hurricanes sometimes have more agency than politicians. So just to, just to say that when we speak about agency, sometimes norms have agency, different from probably how other people would see agency. But I think that's interesting because then you see where power lies and where power rests. So if you're inviting persons to participate, understanding their their place in the power structure is interesting and if you have two people sitting at a table not both of them participate equally because the agents that interact with them are different and that has to be taken into account in understanding their partic their ability to actively participate and and shape outcomes so the types of actors, I won't go into them in detail because I'm short of time, but I'm sure you could think about some actors in environmental governance, multinational corporations. A multinational corporations can help or hinder environmental um, protection. In, in, in many small states, multinational corporations, because they're governed by rules of their the head country often have string, more stringent environmental rules than those of the local government who would be more than happy to have the multinational in their territory but in practice what often also happens as you know is that it's very easy to promise uh, a government um, a government agent that you would pay for their child to go to university and then tick approval for the latest request that you've put to the government. So multinational corporations have a lot of power to participate in decision making. You, know, you have global industry actors as well. Local government, cities, civil society organizations, networks, social movements, public private partnerships, business associations, green clubs, networks of experts. So when we're speaking about participation, it's interesting to know that all of these actors somehow 
and at different scales contribute to decision making, implementing of decisions in shaping the norms and values that determine what happens in environmental governance. So I wanted to, to mention public participation. You know, what is public participation? Why is that important? Well, public participation is, is an element of procedural justice, which I'll go into justice a little more in, in the future, in, in, later on in the, in the talk. But it's, it refers to access to information, involvement in decision making, and also access to justice. And in each of these areas, participation and the challenges of participation become very acute. Access to information and understanding that information is difficult in across scales. At the local scale, often the, the, the actors could be that they don't understand the concepts or that they have other priorities. So the information that you supply to a, a local agent uh, it, is, is never objective, you know. So there's a normative stance when a policymaker or anyone goes into a local context with information. And understanding that is important when, we under, when we're speaking about access to information. And uh, procedural justice also leads to questions of equity and fairness. You know? So participation, again, is heavily normatively charged with issues of justice, fairness, equity. And, uh, and so things like the number of stakeholders present at a decision-making process um, don't determine the quality of participation because it depends on who those uh, actors are and what is their ability to contribute. Um, it's interesting, more interesting to think about were their voices able to contribute or to influence outcomes, not whether they were invited to attend a meeting. And then it's interesting to, again, from the perspective of developing states, you, you might say, you know, it's great to have all these scientific experts attend the meetings, but that means there's less time for sometimes government, appoint, uh, government actors appointed by the citizens of a state to have a voice. You know? So do we want more NGO activists involved in climate change negotiations? Yes. Well. Depends, no? So again, it's interesting just to understand the complexity of layers and the implications of participation of some actors, um, which often means to the exclusion of others. So those, those, those relate to questions of inclusiveness and, and many scholars from the global south study those things, no? The, the participation of, uh, of agents or actors from the global south in many of these global processes and what that means for inclusiveness uh, who pays the ngos who which what are their areas of focus to what extent do they understand the challenges of, uh, of persons from the global south and are those really reflected in their interventions so moving on to oh my goodness Sorry, that was next. Okay. Moving on to complexity um, and participation. Um, again, I can't go into too much detail, but when we think about what makes for good participation, we have to think about the multiplicity of actors, the complex causalities, and the contested solutions. And in each of those cases, uh, we need to ask ourselves, who are the right persons who should participate? in the discussions and and often i like to say that we don't know what we don't know so we need to spend some time trying to figure out who those persons are who are the ones who should be involved in each of these multiple forums what causalities what impacts are, are likely to be felt and by and and by whom yeah and yeah so causality is 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 very complex you know um i think one of the issues uh, on on solar radiation management is one of the issues is is how do we compensate you know 
How do we compensate for damage caused because there will be winners and losers? Well, the question of causality is, is a difficult one. You know, those of you who know about climate litigation also know that it's it's a complex one. Is 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 the flooding caused by climate change or by something else? You can't you can't demand compensation if you're not sure what's the cause. And the scientific uncertainty is 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 there, you know. So um so understanding those complex interactions, the social impacts, you know, climate refugees, and I did, I did a study on that a while ago, and very infrequently are climate refugees only leaving because of weather impacts. You know? They also, the desire to improve their families, greater opportunities, etc. So uh, decision-making when it comes to environmental governance includes these areas of, complexity and causality, which can't be ignored. The challenges of achieving consensus when there are contested solutions. Which solution should prevail? Well, it depends on who you bring to the table. It, in, and this was a comment from, from one of the persons. If you begin by saying, if we don't take action right now, we're gonna lose species at the rate of X percent per year, the next, uh, decision will be let's take action right now and if that action is going to cost 10 billion dollars let's do it but if you begin by saying 10 billion dollars can solve all the problems of malnutrition in Africa in the next 10 years and you have people at the table who can discuss that well then maybe the solution won't be to to put that money into biodiversity right now yeah so it's not clear it, it, it's 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 much easier not to have everyone at the table when you're discussing complex and contested solutions because then you probably wouldn't get consensus but is that the right thing to do is it the right thing to exclude those who will put a spoke in the wheel towards an important environmental outcome and that's that's part of the challenge of participation yeah and of course you have competing interests and at the heart of it, that's often the challenge. Whether it's the interests of citizens, what will it mean for me if we, uh, if we reduce emissions as a citizen, I might have to pay higher um, electricity bills. No, that's not good. I had other things to do with my money. Or the businesses involved, or the agencies, or the in, in, intergovernmental organizations or the scientists. This is an exciting scientific solution. Let's go with it, you know? Um, so you, and I think it's ingenuous to, to think that competing interests are not part of the, uh, the challenge when it comes to environmental governance. You know? So going beyond, and you could say, well, you, you don't know what people are thinking, but, but we do need to understand where people are coming from. And as researchers, we often declare biases, right? I came saying that I'm from a developing state, an island, you know, I should say that I'm from an island, Trinidad and Tobago, and sometimes people are say, oh, I like Africa, and I'm like, I like Africa too, but I'm not from Africa, you know. Um, yeah, so we, it's interesting, and that makes decision making much more complex, you know, understanding those, those biases and those contested uh, views on what the solutions to those environmental governance issues are. Okay, moving on to architectures and frameworks. What is the best system for participation? Well, it depends on what you're speaking about. So it's interesting to, to look at architectures as in areas or arenas of governance. And probably before the year 2000, um, we already saw that states were beginning to sign fewer multilateral environmental agreements. And there were new actors on, this, on the international stage and the national stage. There was the trend towards governance without government. And in my own institute, uh, it's an institute for international relations. We changed our MSc from international studies, international relations to global studies. Uh, re recognizing that many of the main actors in the world today, many of those who participate in governance 
are not states or are not only states. This is not saying the states do not continue to have a very important role, but recognizing that there are other frameworks and areas of governance, other arenas of governance. Important is the privatization of environmental governance. Can anybody think about how is that being privatized? My, my students directed me to these Netflix um, movies on the Marine Stewardship Council and Forestry Stewardship. Uh, those are privatized arenas of privatization of environmental governance where private actors determine the rules. You also have new types of collaboration between private and public actors. Um, one of the outcomes of uh, Rio Plus 20 was precisely the, the prevalence of public-private partnerships. Interesting, some people have looked at how valuable they've been over the years. And I think the fact that many of them still have not been able to achieve their intended goals uh, reflects the difficulty of complex governance structures, you know, and difficulties in achieving outcomes when you have the multiplicity of actors. So we also have new forums, you know, forums where stakeholders can develop norms, standards, and implement and enforce those norms, certification schemes, um, multi-stakeholder partnerships. Uh, are these forums great? Are they good? Or do they entrench democratic def deficits? You know? who, who manages these forums? Who are allowed to participate? So some people speak about post-sovereign world politics, where um, there are new relationships of influence, of responsibility, of stewardship, new relationships of vulnerability. We have, uh, in some countries, we have uh, um, representatives for future generations, you know, and what, where, what for, at what forms are they allowed to participate? In some cases, at the parliamentary level, in some cases, from the outside, you know, like like Greta, you know, on the outside, not, not as part of, of government, but yet still shaping um, and challenging normative positions. Ways to participate in governance. I know my time is running out, but anyway, I'm almost done. Um, but if you think about, okay, what are the, the, let's say, the three most important ways to participate in, in, in governance at any level, you know? Well, I think really important is knowledge and information sharing, because a lot depends on what's put on the table to be discussed, you know, so that agenda setting, that knowledge formation, uh, capacity building, uh, monitoring and review, you know, uh, standard setting. So, so these are ways in which actors do participate in governance. And in each forum, of governance, it's interesting to think who are those actors doing each of these things? Because sometimes if we understand who they are, then we might be more critical on their on, on their positions. Yeah? Uh, then you have, of course, those involved in direct action. And what about funding? Does funding shape outcomes? Does funding shape uh, worldviews? Um, yeah, there's also the convening and, and facilitating participation. Who convenes? Who are invited? What are they invited to speak about? What are they invited to? What problem are they invited to solve? So these participatory processes are not necessarily improving participation. They might be entrenching power dynamics within existing systems. There's so much more I can say on this. Um, there's market-based governance as well. Interesting, I think it was mentioned today, the role of the consumer in shaping, uh, shaping environmental governance. Yeah. I see that a lot more in Europe uh, where there are many people who are very um, conscious about climate change and individually try to reduce their carbon footprint. And that's, uh, that's interesting because then that shapes that, that worldview shapes their um, purchasing choices. And in a sense, the market contributes to uh, reducing the carbon footprint. In other parts of the world, concerns are otherwise. Uh, yeah, is, 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 that, is that correct? That, you know, that everybody's not as concerned about the carbon footprint. 
again, understanding context would be interesting. Okay, I am going to, I, I did speak a little bit about participation scale, quality of governance. I'm just gonna move on to the last point because I know I'm running out of time. Um, let's look at power and power asymmetries. What, what role does that have to, what does that have to do with participation? Well, obviously um, we have to be very critical about our understandings of power and the, and the role of power in shaping environmental outcomes. What alternative structures or systems of governance can reduce some of those existing power symmetries and which ones increase them? Uh, when we speak about justice and participation, justice for whom? Justice, I like to use Plato's analysis of justice to give each one his due, to give each one his due. What does give mean? What are my responsibilities? What are my duties? Each one, who are those persons to whom I owe this justice? Future generations, the little monkey that I showed at the beginning, you know, um, the people in the developing world, the people in the developed world, his due. What does that person deserve? Yeah? And, and those are very complex issues. So when we're speaking about participation and including the concept of justice, uh, some of those things need to, be, need to be taken into account. And I'm running out of time, so I will just end with the question. What are the best ways to guarantee participation? Well, I hope that I've provided some ideas as to the complexity of involved in answering that question. Uh, I didn't answer it, as you probably <laughs> recognize, but because there are many issues that influence participation. And I just like to end with a reflection from a developing state perspective. You know. um, the factors that influence the participation of delegates from developing countries are size. You know, I interviewed on policy coherence and climate change governance. And at the time that I interviewed the experts from the climate department in Belize, Tell me how many people were in that department. Two, two people, okay? So when you compare that with a country like the United States and you both go to COP, is there real participation? You know, yeah, she, each country can speak and has a vote, but um, no, the, the poor two people were running from pillar to post <laughs> trying to cover the, the meetings, yeah? Knowledge, capacity, funding, um, the ability and enthusiasm of individuals. I see that a lot in the developing world. People go above and beyond the call of duty because their just passion is about solving the problems. And those things influence participation as well. Bigger global realities, an economic crisis, a hurricane can influence participation in environmental governance. Um, the nature of funding, who funds? You know? Who funds a workshop on X in, in your state? or in your country. It, that determines who participates, it determines the outcomes as well. So no, I have not answered the question on what makes for good participation, but I hope that um, some of these elements can provide us with um, topics for discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michelle. You've given us a lot to think about here. And before I turn to our panelists, I just wanna welcome the students um, who have joined us and um, just say a word or two because um, you unfortunately didn't hear the beginning part of the, the day. We've been going all day. And so you may have some questions about some of the things that are being discussed. And so, um, for example, solar radiation management, um, this is the energy and society class for people who don't know um, who our students are here. Um, so we spent part of the morning um, this morning t discussing possible geoengineering solutions to climate change, like putting aerosols in the atmosphere to deflect solar radiation. That might get you a solution to climate change, but it's going to create a whole potential cast of other problems. So how do we actually manage those in the context of governance was a topic for basically, you know, a couple hours this morning. Um, so I think those are things that, you know, Dr. Schwam is going to definitely um, keep up uh, the class uh, in terms of addressing, but I just wanted to mention that. And the other thing, um, we had another panelist before Michelle as well talking about the structures of environmental governance and the institutions um, like the biodiversity 
Climate Convention, the Climate Convention, these are um, groups of countries that get together to agree on you know, action, or in many cases, as Michelle was saying, not action. <laughs> um, but as students, you probably um, hear about these, particularly in the fall, the Conference of the Parties, the COPs. There was a big meeting in Glasgow last year, right? And so um, hopefully all of the things that you just heard from Michelle Oh, will sort of help you when you hear about the next one that's coming up, which is going to be in Egypt in November, you can kind of see um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes as opposed to just what you see on TV. There's all these questions of who's there, what are they saying, and so forth. So just a little context for our, our students here, um, and thank you for coming. We appreciate you being here. So we now have time for um, some reactions from our panel and we have four panelists um, who are going to give us um, commentary um, on Michelle's um, very thought-provoking ideas about what constitutes uh, effective equitable um, participation knowledgeable participation as well um, so the first person I'll turn to is our commentator who's on um, zoom um, so Dr. Kavan Rani is a um, associate professor of geography here at Rutgers um, happens to be dialing in from beautiful Jamaica and thank you so much for joining us um, and I'll turn it over to you uh, thanks Pam I, I hope you guys are hearing me oh, fine um, yes we hear you fine okay great I uh, just would like to thank you and the rest of the members on, of the organizing committee for the opportunity to participate in this workshop and just to be in conversation with such an amazing group of scholars. I'm really sorry I'm not there in person, but very much looking forward to the, continuing the discussion on, on, on work um, and work on such an important and timely topic. Um, and I think Dr. Scobie's presentation and research resonates with some of my own interests. Um, being a researcher of Caribbean descent and given my interest in global environmental change and its justice and development implications from a kind of a post-colonial and small island developing states context. I want to focus my commentary on the issue of participation and its potential role, limits and possibilities within environmental governance. And I think my, my comments and thoughts are drawn primarily from my own experience working on environmental issues in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean, and my own observation of the ways environmental policies and regulations oftentimes become the terrain of intense struggles over land rights, resource use, and conservation. Um, my current research investigates the ways ongoing socio-ecological shocks, ranging from extreme weather events so market volatilities and novel crop diseases are unevenly experienced by historically marginalized communities. Um, I'm particularly interested in events labeled as crises and exploring how these events are partly co-produced and made worse by underlying and historically contingent political economic forces. But more importantly, um, how these forces are constantly being negotiated and contested through everyday struggles of vulnerable groups and communities. So a lot of this work relates to environmental governance issues, particularly around how decisions are made in response to actual or perceived socio-ecological crises, who has the power and authority to define the nature and scope of these crises, the solutions to be derived, and how these map onto and are shaped by longer histories of social, economic, and human difference. Um, a core feature of my research link questions around social and environmental justice, because in most cases, the socioeconomic um, groups that are impacted the most by environmental shocks are amongst the poorest and most marginalized groups in society, and have demonstrated the least capacity to protect themselves from harm. So this is where questions of governance overlap with questions around justice. In my experience, participation in and of itself has been insufficient to usher in meaningful material and transformative changes, especially in situations where underlying and deep-rooted um, power dynamics and class differences are ignored. In other words, participation without true re redistribution of power is performative at best. And I'm happy to cite some more concrete examples in the Q&A session um, in how I've seen this played out in my own research. Um, and the last point I'll raise here is a question of the nation state and its role in environmental governance, which may seem a bit strange since discourses 
around governance has effectively decentered the nation state from our analysis in recent decades. In my own experience, the state is still very much an active player and can at times wield overwhelming power. And I can give one quick example here to wrap up. In Jamaica, there is no shortage of laws and regulations. The main problem is enforcement. For one, a lot of current laws are outdated and do not necessarily reflect present day realities. There are loopholes that allow certain powerful actors to negate these laws without facing sanctions. And even if they are found in breach, the fines are extremely low. Um, and finally, even if an EIA is carried out, an environmental impact assessment, and uh, establishes a breach, the state minister with responsibility for the environment has the discretion to still grant approval. Um, and in fact, the National Environment and Planning Agency, which is the main environmental regulatory authority, currently falls under the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, which presents a clear conflict of interest. So the question then, at least in a Jamaican context, is how can we better define and theorize the role of the state in ecosystem governance without losing sight of the ways in which the nation, the nation state itself is subjected to wider political and economic processes in an increasingly interconnected and complex world. And I've found this kind of multi-scalar approach particularly useful in my own research in understanding who gets brought to the table. And it also allows for a more holistic understanding of how and why decisions are made and who gets to shape and benefit from those decisions. And I'll just stop there for now, just to keep within my, my time, but I'm happy to kind of follow up and answer any questions folks may have in the Q&A session. Um, thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. We look forward to getting more of those great examples in the Q&A session. Um, so our next panelist is going to be um, Danielle Falzon, who is a new um, assistant professor of sociology just joining us here at Rutgers this semester. So we're really just throwing you in the deep end here, but welcome um, and looking forward to hearing from you um, your thoughts on participation through some of your work at the COPS that we were just discussing with the students. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really enjoying having this workshop my first week, actually. It's great to meet everyone and to get to with all this wonderful work. And thank you, Michelle, for your really thought-provoking uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I primarily study the governance of climate change. Um, my research specifically focuses on power and equality in um, decision-making, so between the different actors in these different uh, context, institutional context. And so what I repeatedly find in my research is that it's the institutions and organizations through which governance takes place that shapes people's power in decision making. Um, even if these are purportedly democratic environments or if they actively try to make decision making processes more participatory. Um, so the place that this has been most apparent for me is in the UN climate negotiations, the COP meetings. Um, so to give away the punchline a little bit, uh, even though the negotiations are somewhat democratic, um, they stick to a strict policy of consensus based decision making. Um, the way the institution is structured actually works against countries in the global south um, that are there trying to make sure that their priorities are heard. And this is especially true for island states and least developed countries. Uh, and that's because the UNFCCC as an institution is instead constructed to cater to some kind of ideal delegation, I argue, that comes from a well-resourced, wealthy country. And so it systematically marginalizes poorer, formerly colonized countries with fewer resources through the structures of the negotiations, just as a university might cater to some kind of ideal student um, and then disadvantage non-traditional students who, for example, might have uh, children or who might be working full time alongside their studies. So uh, in case you're not already familiar with how these negotiations are structured, uh, there's preparations all year, but the actual meeting takes place over a period of two weeks in which there's lots of meetings along different topic based negotiating tracks. Uh, many of these meetings take place simultaneously. And in these meetings, um, they're actively developing these official texts that will shape international climate policies. So of course, the Paris Agreement is a, a big one that's most recent. 
Uh, so while every country has a right to have negotiators in the room who can contribute to the negotiations and to send uh, written inputs on different issues when they're requested, uh, not every country actually has the ability to do so or to do so um, at the same level of quality. So a big part of the inequality here that Michelle already alluded to briefly is that uh, the countries in the global south, some of them can only send maybe two or three people to the negotiations. So if there's two or three people, and there's four meetings going on at the same time, obviously that country can't be represented in every meeting. And of course, these countries do form negotiating groups like AOSIS, uh, typically, uh, which coordinates and negotiates as a group usually, which is, gives them some kind of power because they're an alliance there. Um, but still, each country individually lacks the power to make their own interventions in meetings that they're not attending. So those three, two or three people also typically don't include a legal or technical expert. So they have to try to consult someone back home or from their coordinating group or elsewhere to get advice as issues arise. Uh, their job at home also probably isn't just focusing on the specific issue on which they're negotiating at the negotiations. Um, in contrast, the US has people at the State Department, for example, who do climate finance literally all year. That's the only thing they work on. Um, and so when the the negotiator from the small island state goes home at the end of the day, they have to refer back to their other job responsibilities as well. Um, then they also have to make sure that they're contributing text, textual inputs for whatever was asked for that day from the different uh, negotiating tracks. So they're just exhausted. What I've heard from them is they're absolutely exhausted. They don't sleep, they don't eat. And in, in turn, they also don't negotiate as well. So it's already a logistical challenge for them, but then also they, they their experience there is, I mean, there are people, I heard many people just say, like, we're humans, we need to eat and sleep. <laughs> um, so, uh, so of course, there's variance. I want to acknowledge, like, in some global South countries, of course, send very large delegations. Many of them have negotiators, even small island states, who have been part of the UNFCCC process for many, many years, which is a huge strength for most of them, because it is a really confusing using process. Um, and that variance, though, is exactly the point. The institution is privileging these particular characteristics in how it's structured. And so those structures ultimately produce and reproduce inequalities between countries. And in this case, it creates numer numerous barriers for delegations from some of the countries in the world that have the most at stake in the negotiations. And very briefly, um, I want to say something about um, what I also do work in Bangladesh on adaptation. One minute. Okay, great. Um, so there's a very similar pattern in climate adaptation efforts in Bangladesh. Uh, while organizations say that they want their projects to be participatory, right now there's this growing interest in this idea of locally led adaptation. Uh, there's many institutional structures in place that make it impossible for local people to access or control adaptation finance on their own. There's distrust for local people and cultural marginalization of their knowledge and their experiences, um, which ultimately elevates the position of actors from NGOs, government offices, and funders so that those, those actors can retain control over the process no matter what. Um, as Michelle mentioned, even when there's a consultation meeting, whoever's organizing it kind of decides who's there, where it takes place, what's discussed. Um, people there probably don't necessarily know the language that's being used. It takes a long time for them to, to actually participate meaningfully if they do it all. Um, and then ultimately that organization decides what they take out of those consultations and, uh, and decide how to interpret it and apply it to their projects if they even do that. So I'm gonna wrap up. Ultimately, what I wanna say is that we need to keep a close eye on how our institutions of environmental and climate governance are structured, because often these inequalities that are produced are built into the structures and often those, those structures are not immediately clear or evident. So thanks. Great, thank you, Danielle. So our next speaker is gonna be Dr. Victoria Raymondzoni, who is an assistant professor at human ecology and part of our organizing um, group for this workshop as well. So Vic. Hello everybody, I'm Victoria. I'm uh, like Pam was saying, I'm also a professor at human ecology. Glad to have you guys here, the next generation. Um, so basically, let me tell you a little bit of what I do. I'm an anthropologist, I work on the ground, so I'm at the end of many of the conversations that we have had so far. So we looked at everything from a governance, more institutional side, what happens on the ground. So I want to speak a little bit about two things that I want you guys to remember from what I say. 
The first one is related to accountability. So how do we as scientists account for the decisions that we make when we're studying or trying to influence some of the processes here? Um, why I wanna talk about that is related to one of the projects that I have been involved in uh, very recently. It's a transdisciplinary project. That means that it includes scientists and researchers and uh, members of the government from all different sectors and we're looking at a particular problem related to how do um, we anticipate and predict um, better adaptation measures in terms of sea level rise in the tri-state area so dr cop actually talked about that early today um, and i want to tell you about one little problem that we encounter very early on so when you look at transdisciplinary models of science production, basically they include the participation of different communities as long as, uh, along with um, different scientists and different experts in the process of formulating the problem of, that we want to intervene upon. So that was our first obstacle right here, or opportunity, some would say, was to identify the communities that we were gonna work with in terms of addressing this problem. So that created a lot of uh, work. It took us about a year to identify two different communities that were proposing on intervening. And why I want to bring that up is that when we're choosing communities, especially when you're a social scientist, most of you are gonna be working on similar issues when you guys graduate, um, you have to select where you're gonna work, right? So who gets to say which community is going to be the focus of your effort when many of the efforts that we're going to be working on are actually going to provide benefits to the communities. So where do we uh, get the criteria to actually choose one community over another? Who gets to benefit? That will be the, the problem. So that brings a lot of issues in terms of accountability. So how do we as scientists, experts, Policy, uh, policy makers, decision makers, decide to work on a community and not on other community. Um, the second element that I want you guys to think about is related to many of the terms that we've been using so far. So we've been talking about governance, we've been talking about nation state, we've been talking about adaptation, we've been talking about sustainability. These are terms that have different meanings over time and they change. They change a lot depending on who's using them, right? So when we think about projects that uh, occur in other countries, I work a lot in Cuba, I work in Indonesia, some of the most important obstacles that I have encountered on the ground when I'm looking at the efforts that are being implemented through different channels and different scales have been related to how they interpret these different terms. So this is known as the problem of translation You'll find that in the literature if you guys are interested to know more about that. But basically, it's not just about the translation of the term, but what are the different meanings that the term may assume in different contexts? And much of what Dr. Scooby actually talked about speaks to that. So the nature of the relations that are involved in many of these different efforts of conservation or efforts of um, management and mitigation. So, in short, what I want to say is basically two things. First, you have to think about the role that you're playing within the system and that the decisions that you make are having consequences for others. That is critically important. And the second element is related to the terms that we use, the different languages that we speak, and how by focusing on certain more technical aspects of the terms that we're using, we're actually not looking at how those terms are actually being implemented on the ground. And that there's a whole set of, trans, uh, I would say, transversal actors that work through many of these levels that we looked at. Uh, for example, NGOs and facilitators that actually are in charge of implementing many of the different programs that the NGOs develop, that actually translate the terms on their own terms. So, um, what happens sir? Why is that there's no accountability uh, about that? So thank you.
Great, thank you, Vic. And so our last panelist is also from the Department of Human Ecology, um, and that is Dr. Simi Payne, who's an associate professor and teaches environmental law. If the students um, are aware of that, you will have to take that sometime soon if you haven't done it already. <laughs> oh, and they're here, yes, fantastic. Simi, welcome. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'll take my mask off. Um, good afternoon. Um, I, I'm going to start with the premise that participation and transparency are core governance values. I think you've already been convinced of that today. And and talk a little bit about my research in recent years, which is centered on the problem. I'm a lawyer, OK? So I'll come clean. Um, on the problem of translating the concerns that Michelle identified into specific legal language that will eventually, in turn, translate into institutions, rules, and processes that then may be animated in a way that will make them functional and respond to the concerns we're discussing or not. Um, and so there, there's this continuous process that is valuable for study and also for participation in, in trying to pursue what we determine for ourselves and through our communities as the deep values that we want to uphold. Because I, I think especially from Michelle's presentation, you should have gotten the sense that somewhere amongst all this complexity, there have to be decisions about what is the goal we're going to pursue at a particular time in order to undertake a course of action and move forward. Um, and, and that'll have compromises. Um, I've also just incidentally been, uh, incidentally, I would just like my last three papers were about this, um, posing questions about what is the international community, which is a term that's used in international law fairly often, um, but not defined. Um, what is owed to the international community and who can appropriately, validly, um, equitably represent its interests. And I look at that through a legal lens. So really constrained by legal issues. So in the next few minutes, I wanna uh, introduce you to a nearly concluded major treaty that has the goal of conserving marine biodiversity and ensuring that human activities affecting it are sustainable. And this is the treaty that you've already heard a bit about. And let's see, yes. So where is it? This is the high seas, the light blue area. You can sort of see the land masses, uh, 1982, Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, countries agreed that they would take all the dark blue part for themselves as their exclusive economic zone over which they exercise a lot of rights. And this, you'll notice that if you happen to be an island that has uh, one square mile, you get a 200 mile radius around your country. And that is your country. And this is one of the things from participating in the negotiations for six years and talking with people from the Pacific Island states, from the Caribbean. Uh, I've come to understand that when you see that dark blue around their island, they relate to that in a way that New Jersey does not relate to our exclusive economic zone. We think about our near coastal. They really are out there. So this is half the Earth's surface. Everyone has a stake. Nepal comes to these negotiations, a landlocked state. Switzerland comes to these negotiations. OK, they have economic interests, too. And they did win the America's Cup sailboat race. <laughs> OK, um, I'm just going to flip through animal slides. But what I wanted to, this is telling you who the other stakeholders are. And that's really one of the key questions here. And I hope in what I've said so far, I've sketched out that there are a lot of stakeholders in making decisions about how to dispose of this huge part of our planet. And these are some of the human activities that we're deciding about. Uh, fisheries that people 
in developing and developed countries. That's from Senegal. Uh, so it's actually the coastal fishery. Uh, but it's affected by what happens in the high seas. Um, shipping, uh, various kinds of seabed activities, including possibly seabed mining. So decisions need to be made about how to do this. And in this treaty that's currently being negotiated, we almost finished it in August. We're hoping that we'll finish it by March. OK. Um, it includes participation elements, environmental impact assessment, um, and specifically, that includes public notification and consultation. Um, transparency is a value in that treaty. So ultimately, all the questions that Michelle has raised and that Kivan and Vic and Danielle have talked about, those are coming into these treaty texts. We have a chance to sort of put the rubber to the road, um, but it's gonna take a lot of work. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'd like to invite our panelists um, to come up here and join Michelle up at the front um, and move into the question and answer session right now. So we've got a lot of really interesting things to discuss. Um, and uh, I'll definitely open it up for, for questions from the floor. But I thought maybe to kick things off, um, I'd have everyone potentially um, respond to one of the provocative things that Michelle said, which was this idea that not all actors are agents, that, that to be an agent really means that you're shaping the outcomes in, in, in substantial ways or you're, you're an agent of change. Um, but there are a lot of people who are considered to be stakeholders or actors or participants in all of these environmental laws and negotiations and so forth that maybe are not actually agents. Um, and so I guess one question that raises is, because we're in a university setting and you know, we're being trained as scientists or social scientists and so forth, um, is the training that we are doing for our students, for ourselves, for our collaborators, helping to move actors into being agents? Does the sort of supply of um, knowledge, the supply of um, skills and negotiation and so forth that we at university settings train and teach about, does that help? Does that work? Do we see the impacts of that in different places? Is that part of what our role as universities potentially is um, to help turn actors who maybe have gotten a seat at the table um, but have not yet become that agent yet. Um, what can be the role of uh, institutions of higher learning in, in helping that process along? So maybe that's a place to start. So Michelle, do you wanna go first and then we'll see what our panelists say? Thanks, that's a, that's a, a difficult question. And um, I think that um, if I understand the question, it's the, the role of the university in shaping agents, yeah? I think that that precisely, so I'm gonna come at this from something that apparently has nothing to do with it. I was at a Commonwealth Scholars meeting maybe a decade ago in the UK, and one of the things that they discussed was the, the role of universities in providing knowledge to their students and knowledge with multiple contexts yeah? so i think real agency is has to be interdisciplinary um in in terms of the focus that the university provides for the students because understanding multiplicity and complexity which is something that true interdisciplinary study can do can really help individuals to become not siloed in their understanding of things and i think that contributes to more effective participation in, in cases where agency can truly be exercised. The alternative, I think, um, is, uh, is producing, you know, perhaps um, persons with a university degree, but really lack that uh, one of the key elements of agency is that being an authoritative actor, you know, somebody who has that legitimacy and I think 
now uh, that legitimacy requires uh, the, on the part of the actor a certain appreciation of context and of the realities of others, which sometimes is unfortunately missing in in, in negotiations at the government level, etc. Do others want to speak to this? Will this just do, or do I need to do something to it? No, I think it's, it should be on, yeah. OK. Um, so I, I was having a hard time thinking about how to answer that question until, uh, Michelle, you said um, being an authoritative actor and having an appreciation of context and the realities of others. Um, so, and, and the application I have to it is that um, one of our undergraduates was, accompanied uh, me to the negotiations for the last two negotiating sessions. And since I wasn't able to be physically present um, in the last rounds, she was there on her own and she was recognized as someone who had something valuable to bring um particularly as a youth spokesperson and so i you know i've been thinking like how does she move to take advantage of what they saw in her as she suddenly put on a podium and i, I think i so thank you <laughs> for answering that question but i i think it's you know so it to me it seems like giving opportunity but also providing the scaffolding and uh maybe an ear to listen i'm I'm thinking uh, much more about how we make partnerships, even with our students, how we are try to be more lateral and less vertical in our relationships. Yeah, and just to add on to the great comments that have already been made, I think. Um, also, not only in terms of, so in sociology, we like to talk a lot about the interplay between structure and agency. Um, so not only recognizing and being able to uh, relate to the context and uh, positions of others who are different from ourselves, but also understanding your own or the, the structural constraints that are in place that might be different for um, our students or for, for people that are both more and less privileged than, than them in different contexts and understanding that kind of deeper level of context and um, and circumstances that might uh, might limit or or facilitate different people's participation. Yeah, maybe if, if I could just jump in, I, I think I mean, that's a, that's a, <laughs> it's a great question. And I think at the heart of it is the question of power. And it ties into Danielle's comment about structure and agency, right? Because in many cases, like, when I think about the type of research that I do, it's very important to understand context and to understand who is driving a lot of the decisions that are being made. And so like farmers are always actors, right, within the ministry, but there are certain farmers that by virtue of the resources they have and the kind of what we call in, in Jamaica links that they have are better able to, to, to shape certain policies by virtue of who they are and who they have access to. And I think within academia, one of the things that we need to be very careful of is the ways in which the knowledge that we produce can either disrupt or push back on some of these existing structures, which allows agency, um, or in some cases, stifles agency. And I've seen where, for instance, GIS mapping, in terms of the ways in which even how we go about identifying land can open up places for capital accumulation and lead to land dispossession. And so in many cases, knowledge can be used in a very dangerous way. And we have to be very careful of the context in which our research um, is situated and who it is that we're kind of working with and how that work, the work that we do can either empower or disempower different actors, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that this has a lot of relevance right now to some of the work that Rutgers Climate Institute is doing. And I don't know if Marjorie is still able to join us, um, but hopefully she will be part of the discussions tomorrow as well, because one of the things that she has been doing through the Rutgers Climate Institute 
um, is working with other universities to help train students to be part of the delegations that go to these big climate meetings, um, both as a you know, uh, training exercise for students to learn about, you know, how do these these negotiations happen, um, you know, all the questions of, you know, whose voice is actually heard, um, but also at the same time, um, potentially use the students to disrupt some of these problems because there's been um, a discussion of, you know, a lot of these students go and they kind of feel like they're, they're, they're on the sidelines. And what if we could have a different model where students are helping delegations, right? We, we heard like there's one person who's trying to go to five different places. Well, what if students could go and take notes and bring them back to the delegate, right? And what if there are ways that we could, we could sort of empower our students and, um, and youth who are at these to help shift some of these you know uh, you know as minor as it may be it might be you know as Kalan was saying and as michelle said like crack the door open a little bit and 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 see if that disrupts some of what's going on so um so marjorie's been working hard with the university climate change network on some upcoming trainings we had it up we had the announcement up earlier we could put it up later um about some webinars about um training students to be able to do these um but i think that's a really important part of our mission, and we'll be discussing that um, even more tomorrow when we talk about sort of taking. Oh, here we go, Marjorie. Yes, do you want to, Marjorie? Do you want to hop on and say anything about some of the the work that you've been doing on this question? Yeah. Can't unmute. Okay. Oh, Matt. Matt's going to unmute you here in a second. Oh my, okay. there we go. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we're gonna put you on the spot. Well, yeah, you are putting me on the spot. And of course I'm home with COVID probably, um, but <laughs> but um, thank, this has been great. And I, I'm really interested in hearing what everybody's saying. You know, Pam, I think it's gonna take a little while for us to get ourselves into this position, but this conference is a really wonderful opportunity to take this all back. And you know, there's there's so many options here and so we're dipping our toe in the water as Rutgers, and, but we're learning a lot from all the other universities that we're collaborating with through the University Climate Change Coalition. And I think that um, maybe we'll do some rocking and rolling, we'll see. But, but also, I think part of also what I've heard from folks is, you know, there's a question about where we are in our position as, you know, sort of elite university folks and, you know, how we, you know, don't have the lived experiences of uh, some of these other um, nations. And so it's, it's a balance and we have to be very sensitive to that. So. Yeah. yeah, definitely for sure. Yeah. But this is, a, uh, I think, a really important discussion to think about how can we, um, as an institution of higher learning, you know, with goals towards improving environmental management, but also training of our students sort of combine these in, in the activities that we're doing. And so if students have any questions for our panelists or have ideas in particular about how you might be involved in some of these um, governance issues, right? They sound sort of, uh, you know, higher scale, but they don't necessarily have to be. There are things that we're doing on local levels as well. So questions, comments? Yeah, please. Yep. No. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and I think it's a really interesting thing that you pointed out that not um, all the actors are agents, and I never really thought about that until now. So my question here is, like, is our goal to make all actors agents? And if so, like, how would we deal with even more added complexity? Because there's just more people with power. Thank you. Question? 
<laughs> so that opens a whole Pandora box of issues. Uh, it's hard to come up with, a, with an answer to that kind of a question. Um, so it goes back to what is the problem that we're dealing with and who is actually involved in the problem. Um, is the objective to turn every single actor into an agent? Um, that's a great question. I don't know how I could possibly answer that. But I think what is more important for us here to know is um, what are the kinds of things that we can do for you guys so you guys can get access to opportunities so you can experience that and uh, you can be more confident in terms of becoming uh, natural resource manager. So who's, who's going to be going to academia from you guys? Anyone is gonna stay in academia? Who wants to do a PhD when you finish up? Raise your hands. So everybody else, what, what else do you guys want to do? Work in um, environmental office, NGO? Who wants to work in an NGO? Nobody? <laughs> One. So. Where do you guys see yourselves? I think that is important for us to know so we can facilitate the opportunities. So you guys get the confidence and the exposure that you need. Not because of, you know, you need to know that, but it is important to be able to experience those things to realize that the job that you guys are going to be doing is difficult. Um, I think, I think that uh, it is, so to, with regard to the second part of your question, what do we do with all this complexity? I think the important thing to recognize is right now, even though the problems big, do seem really big and complex, they're still excluding a lot of, a lot of viewpoints, um, systematically excluding a lot of viewpoints. And so um, it, despite the existing complexity, it's almost oversimplified how we're looking at a lot of these problems right now. And so a goal would be to, uh, stop systematically excluding people, um, to, even if not every single person is is an agent. Every there's no one who's being systematically kept out of the conversation. So, for example, uh, in the UN climate negotiations, I mean, future generations is is often touted as one of the most vulnerable groups. But there's no really there's no way for youth to contribute directly to decision making. Um, there's like a group called the Youngos, the youth. NGOs or something um, that can make statements in particular contexts, but there's no youth, uh, formal youth participation as like a delegation, like a state delegation would have. So uh, yeah, so there, there's just these exclusionary measures that are already in place. So even though adding a youth voice might add to the complexity, it also might bring up a lot of issues that aren't on the table right now. So I, I think also your question raises the, uh, a corollary question, which is, do all stakeholders want to be agents? And how can we think about representativeness? Um, uh, there's a really outstanding uh, young man, from my point of view, who has been representing CARICOM, which is the Caribbean nations that were part of the British Commonwealth. Um, and he has led that effort on behalf of those countries. So they, he puts in un, untold hours and does a superb job. And he is a real active agent. This is in the BB&J negotiation. Um, so all those governments don't have to do it alone. Um, and they collaborate with the Pacific Island states now because they reached out and coordinated. So now you have a more powerful agent who can speak on behalf of a group. So thinking about those coordination mechanisms, ways, what is, and thinking about what is representativeness. And actually, I actually want to throw one thing in here. Um, Dr. Schwam and I did a paper ages ago on geoengineering, risk management, and participation. And one of the questions we came up with is, it, the question that was raised this morning, who makes the decisions? And so the related question that I want to throw out is, maybe governments actually aren't terrible representatives. Country, some countries don't have the kind of uh, public plebiscite possibility that other countries have. 
So maybe the government, you know, consulting everybody isn't a possibility. Uh, we can't get a universal vote. So, but maybe the country's government actually do, is the closest thing to having people's interests at heart. I don't know. I'd love to hear someone test that. <laughs> Jennifer, thanks for your question. Um, is it is our goal to make all actors agents? And um, I don't think so. Um, actors participate in whatever structure or system we're, we're speaking about. But I think the real question is who should be the agents but don't have agency, you know? And discovering, spending some time thinking about that, I think it's, it's quite challenging. Yeah? I think that's the first thing. And then, um, which agents have agency but should have less? When I was doing my PhD, I saw that some NGOs had more power at the UN and the World Bank than my country did. You know? And some individuals um, earn more per year than my country's gross national product. Yeah? And those are real sources of power and agency. And should those be the sources of power and agency? Yeah? So yes, you should give NGOs more of a voice, but at what cost? You know? and, uh, and the answer to that, I don't think there's a single answer. Again, it depends on the context, what we're speaking about. And, and I think when we're speaking about shaping structures for governance, whether it be at the local scale or the international scale, it's interesting to ask ourselves those questions. You know, who should be agents but don't have agency? And what do we need to do to improve that? So going back to the BBNJ negotiations, WhatsApp has been extremely helpful in agency in the negotiations. As simple as that might seem, but we had four WhatsApp groups, one for each of the areas of BBNJ negotiations. And for the first time in real time, our negotiators were able to get the advice from experts throughout the region that we could not have had before. So WhatsApp increased the agency of developing states negotiators. Of course, it's not ideal because negotiators from other states had their experts focused solely on the negotiations in New York the the experts from developing states were doing their other job while looking at their whatsapp probably when they're in another meeting trying to answer the questions so it's still not perfect but it's interesting to see okay what systems can in, increase the agency of the actors that should have it and and that's i think an important part of governance that sometimes we, we don't think about additional questions No questions online. Okay. Can I, can I ask yeah, them? Yeah, yeah, so I, wa I wanted to ask you guys, do you guys come across opportunities to like, you know, participate in research or attend um, events like the UN? Do you get those emails on your inbox? Yes, no, no, no. Would you guys be interested in taking part of things like that, like research projects? So what can we do to make that happen? Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that um, one thing that I want you guys to know, I always tell my students in class, is that um, researchers, professors, we're human beings. We're like you guys. So we are you 20 years ago. We used to be like you. So you have to not be afraid to ask. <laughs> about things like that. Uh, and we're often looking for students like you. It's really hard to find people that are motivated to do the work that we do. It's difficult, it's challenging. But uh, don't be afraid to ask. Ask your professors. Yes, you're looking at me like, eh. <laughs> Well, just to say, I mean, we we have this um, incredible advantage of being close to UN headquarters in New York, and so that's something that Rutgers Global Office and the various departments have been in sort of constant 
um, discussions about how can we facilitate those better and, and where can we do that. And so Simi's done it in some of her classes. I know some of the other um, classes have made either trips in or brought students and so forth. So it sounds like this is something we need to continue to do. We have um, interest among um, students and the more we can do um, on that maybe tomorrow in our roundtables talking about like what are the next steps? Like how can we improve teaching? Maybe this sort of experiential taking advantage of where we are um, and getting our students plugged in more into these processes because um, there's tons of them right there's the environmental ones there's the social ones there's the economic meetings that are going on at the UN and uh, we should take advantage of that I mean it helps us really sort of put that we have that slogan like Jersey reach global what is it global scope Jersey Jersey roots global yeah scope and so it's like well we have to actually do that <laughs> so. Yeah, come up, Rachel. And to that end, too, I think um, the idea that there's all these um, opportunities at the international level, kind of in New York City, but then there's also these opportunities going on. And um, I know this, yeah, right here, right? At, you know, and some of you guys are probably, I think some of you are enrolled in the climate action internship. And, um, but also, I know these. At least some of these students identified to me the other day. They're inter interested in in corporate governance and you know in those private governance, all those things that you talked you know mentioned. Um, but how like dealing with those problems of how we get that information out there, how we make it useful, how we make sure it's legitimate, right? All those kinds of um, issues, and there's opp opportunities to work on those kinds of things too. So. So do any of our online um, folks have additional questions for the panel? Yeah. Nothing, nothing in the chat, okay. Okay, we've got a question over here. Hi, my name, ooh, that's loud, sorry. My name's Emily, and I had a question. It kind of goes back more to the main um, presentation where it talks about the best ways to guarantee participation, and I think some of the like ways stated were either you know, size, passion, and funding, and there might have been a few more. And from what I'm hearing, I feel like it's kind of like the size or like number of representatives that can really gu guarantee participation, but is there any other argument that like passion or funding can kind of guarantee participa participation more than size. Thank you. Um, thanks, Emily. Emily, right? Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> Everything depends, right? So that's, that's what lawyers learn at the beginning. When a client comes to you, you have to say, well, it depends, you know. Um, but it depends. What guarantees more participation depends on context. If you're talking about international negotiations, often size helps. Um, but then there are many other things, norms, understandings, uh, context. So, for example, I think the discussion on solar radiation management now and the discussion on solar radiation management in 20 years time will be affected by context you know the more urgent we see the need to address climate change is the um the is, is one of the factors that determines who participates in the resolution of the problem you know so the bigger the problem the that that changes who the actors could be involved or should be involved in it. So I think technology is another factor that um, it, that guarantees participation or not, you know. Um, so I was at an, a conference in, in a state, I won't say which one, but the electricity went like around eight times, right? So not everybody was able to present and participate. Um, technology also is a factor in, in many developing countries. And in, in fact, people just can't, can't uh, access the forums for participation. Power is defined in many ways. There's normative power, there's reputational power, there's economic power, there's political power, there's military power, and each of those affects participation in different ways. No? So in my, in my university, 
um, and, and this happens in many developing states, the library can't afford many of the journal subscriptions that are available in developed countries. That affects the areas in which research can be done. It affects research outputs and it affects the way the world understands a scientific problem. Yeah? So what can help guarantee participation? Well, if you define power as the ability of, of libraries to get more journal subscriptions, well then yes. But you can see that there are multiple elements involved in, in how we even understand scientifically a problem. You know, where's the research? What the IPCC says is based on research that's published. Who publishes the research? Where do they come from? What resources do they have? What agendas do they have? So, yeah. So all of these, it, it, I hate to say it's complex because it just sounds like an easy way to answer the question, but I think it's, it's, it's the most truthful way to answer the question. Well, we have come to the end of this session, so thank you for a great set of questions and really interesting discussion about um, how do we manage these competing demands um, on the, the role of participation and how do we reconcile it with complexity and um, all of the things that we've been discussing today. How do we build out institutions to you know, make all this possible? Um, or do we even want to do that? Do we want to encourage more bottom-up support? So I think we've got a lot of really rich things on our plate to potentially discuss. So um, shall I turn it over to you, Rachel? Oh, okay. Yeah, so Rachel's going to make a quick announcement, and then I will come up and tell us what our next steps are. Yeah. Okay, so for the students that are about to leave, just um, make sure you signed in so you can get extra credit. The, the sheets are right up front there. And please take some food on your way out because there's so much we don't want it to go to waste. Okay. Yeah. For sure. Yes. Yeah, so please do. So we are going to now shift modes a little bit. The students um, are going to be leaving us. Or feel free to stay. I know some of you may want to stay, and you are more than welcome to. Um, we thought what we might do now is move into.